This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. This is a show about ideas, people, and behaviors that are considered inappropriate, out of bounds, or beyond the pale. The things you're not supposed to talk about if you're a school teacher, a college professor, a businessman, a politician, a parent, a neighbor, or even a podcast host. These are the things you're not supposed to say or even think if you're a good liberal, a good conservative, or a good citizen. Each week, I'll interview a person who has something bad to say. They might be a journalist or a professor. They might be a porn star or a drug dealer. They might just be an ordinary person with an ordinary job who doesn't care about the rules of polite society. I'm not interested in breaking the rules just to be a troublemaker. I'm interested in people who break the rules of conventional thought and to expand the scope of what is possible to say in our society. I'm interested in people who make me think. We've just confirmed two special guests for the Renegade University weekends in Washington, D.C. and Los Angeles. Dr. Christopher Ryan, the author of Sex at Dawn, will be joining us in Los Angeles on February 2nd. And Camille Foster of Freethink Media and the Fifth Column podcast will be at the Renegade University event in Washington, D.C. from March 15th to the 17th. For more information and to buy tickets to the Renegade University weekend events in Washington, D.C. and Los Angeles, go to thaddeusrussell.com slash courses. All societies have secrets. And all civilizations have discontents. My guest this week has made a career out of exposing some of our society's dirtiest secrets and of documenting the people who have broken the rules of civilization in the most spectacular and amazing ways. This is my interview with Julian Nitzberg. So I had this weird experience last night. I was preparing for this interview today with Julian Nitzberg, who I've known for 10 years, right? Close to 10 years, we just yes, discovered. Sir. And I was thinking, why on earth haven't I had Julian on the show? I mean, you're such, you're the most unregistered person I know. <laughs> you should have been on the show, maybe the first guest. I don't know why. Well, I think it's because you were sort of in between projects and we were thinking about, um, when we were thinking about having you on the show, I think you weren't, you didn't have a project that had just come out and I yeah. kind of wanted to wait for it. And the yeah. project you were working on at the time that I was aware of is this absolutely phenomenal project that is how we met. You asked me for help with it, researching yeah. it in 2011. Yeah. Um, about you had discovered, you had discovered this incredible underworld, I guess, or subculture of gay marine porn. Yeah. And have been working on this. Gay U.S. marine porn. Gay U.S. Not, marine. Not seals and dolphins. That's right. So, I mean, some seals might be in it, but not, <laughs> not dolphins. Oh, right, right. Yeah. Marines, as in the Marine Corps. Yeah. Yeah, soldiers. So, and it's a remarkable, remarkable project. And you've been on KCRW and NPR, and you've written some articles about it, and uh, you've continued to work on it, and you want to make it into a documentary film, right? Right. But well, that was a documentary podcast that we did for KCRW. Right. And you've, well, and you've also been working on many other projects because you're a, you're a, a director and producer in Hollywood and you do all kinds of stuff, but, and you've had a career that's utterly remarkable in a lot of ways. And you are best known for the wild and wonderful whites of West Virginia, which I, and many people consider to be one of the greatest documentary films ever made. Oh, thank you. It's certainly up there. I would, I would recommend it. It's probably in my top 10 or 20, I would say. Mm -hmm. And it is. So number 19. 19, <laughs> but it's, it's moving up fast. It is, it's probably the most renegade documentary I've ever seen. Um, it, the people in it are hillbillies in West Virginia who do everything exactly wrong as Americans. They do everything you're not supposed to do, but we'll, we'll get into that in a second. So why don't we, what I want to do is have you just tell the story, this incredible story of like how you found out about this gay Marine porn thing, why it matters, why you care about it, what you think it means and where it stands. What's, the, what's that story? Okay, so a um, friend of mine named Frank Rodriguez is, you know, this been my friend since college, and it's kind of uh, someone who goes, who's you know, investigate a lot of the gay underworld. He's gay, and um, and uh, for a while, he and his boyfriend, who's now his husband, were very obsessed with marine culture, and um, and uh, but somehow they found these 
these videotapes back in the day. They were sold some places, but they were very much underground, passed around. And um, there, um, this guy Bobby Garcia, and Bobby Garcia is so his background. And tell me if I'm telling too much, but um, is because actually John Waters ended up doing an article about him years later in his book Role Models. Um, he was Raquel. He's this. No one's quite sure if he's Filipino or Mexican, but the consensus seems to be Filipino. Um, and he somehow came to L.A. and allegedly got a job being Raquel Welch's personal assistant. And um, and he saw the movie Sex, Lies, and Videotape. And unlike most people who thought, like, James Spader is kind of creepy, he was just like, oh, my God, James Spader is really cool. He's <laughs> videotaping all these people and using that as a way to seduce people in a weird way. And um, he ended up, for Raquel Welch, driving down to Orange County to do some errand and got to Oceanside, California, which is where the Marine base is. And he just- Camp, Camp Pendleton. Camp right? Pendleton, yes. Mm -hmm. And he looked around and he was just like, oh, you know, my fucking God, these are the hottest men ever. And so to be like James Spader, he got himself a video camera. This is in the late 80s. And he would rent motel rooms and he'd get Marines and um, and you would tell them, I've got all this beer at my place. You can come party. I'm working for a porno company in the San Fernando Valley who's looking for new porn stars. If you want to audition, come to my room. I'll give you $50. You come to my room and you masturbate in front of me. And, um, and Marines started showing up. And they're all like, I could be in porno. Oh, my God. And... Um, and uh, of course, it might bespeak the lack of intelligence on Marines' part because, <laughs> um, and how they're good at following orders but not thinking. Because if you listen to Bobby for three seconds, it's so clear there's he's got no connection to porno, and he is the most. I mean, I I think I said in the article he's. If you were going to create a negative stereotype of gay people. Like if some homophobe created a negative stereotype <laughs> of gay people, it would be kind of Bobby Garcia. He's just like, he's like, oh, darling, I love it. Like, it's like a negative stereotype of Filipino and gay people. Like, mm -hmm. he's just like, he's like, he's just ridiculous. Like, and so what he does is he gets these guys in the room masturbating and then he'll say, hey, honey, let me in. Uh, the porno people, they don't like the way you're masturbating. I got to show you how they like to see you masturbate. And um, and they'll be like, well, well, he goes, let me just show you. And he'll reach in and start masturbating. Them. <laughs> a straight U.S. Marine. A straight U.S. Marine. 19 or 20 year old guy yeah. usually, right? And, and if they don't flinch, he'll just keep moving on. And then he'll just keep jerking them off. And then um, sometimes he will start blowing them. And, um, and sometimes if, you know, some people, some of the Marines just pull back and he knows not to go there. Um, but other times he actually had like, um, tear off pants, uh, what are those called? <laughs> yeah. And, um, and he would just rip them off and like slip their cock into his butt and start fucking them. And he'd be like, fuck my man pussy and like all this stuff. And um, while the while the cameras are rolling, while the cameras are rolling, um, he loved baby oil. He'd always be like pouring baby oil um, onto them, which was very bizarre. And um, and you could like it become like all you're watching it. It's almost like in um, smell of vision. Like you just imagine the scent of like sweating, um, confused Marines with tons of baby oil. And um, and so he did these videos and. But he start, they start taking off, and all these Marines were like, oh, 50 bucks, I'll go. Is that all they were paid? It was really cheap, Jeez. yeah. And um, and so my friend Frank, and you know, one time I was hanging out there, and um, and he's like, you need to see this. And, um, and we started watching it, and we were just like, it was me and my friend, an ex-girlfriend of mine, and we were just mouth and gave. It was like a Hitchcock movie. It was like suspenseful beyond belief because you keep waiting for the Marine to punch him. Like yeah, you're like totally. You're like, 
this is how is this possible how is this possible yeah, yeah like when's he gonna realize that he's just been tricked into having gay sex and um and they never do and um and there's hundreds of these guys who've done it and so hundreds 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 like yeah like apparently, hundreds of straight marines yeah apparently have been fucked in the ass on video no tape. no they don't get fucked in the ass or they get blown they or get they blown get, or, or they, they fuck get him a hand job they, oh sorry they fuck him right okay. yeah they fucked a guy okay yeah no. just as good yeah okay well no not quite but you know they're tops at least for them i guess that would be their saving grace yeah yeah and um if they if they were to ever to explain it back at the barracks or to mom and dad well at least i was a top mom yeah yeah <laughs> and it's not like the amazing thing about bobby is like you know, like every straight guy's like, you know, there's certain guys where it's just like, oh, Brad Pitt. Oh, yeah, I, I'd fuck Brad Pitt. Mm -hmm. Like there's like those few exceptions that like straight men will make like, oh, uh, well, you know, mm -hmm. young Johnny Depp's so pretty, you know, mm -hmm. like, you know, but he's not, you know, Bobby's you said, not. You said he looked like what did, Manuel Noriega without the acne scars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I forgot I said that. <laughs> yeah, that that does a good job and not in shape. Not in shape. Yeah, just a very unattractive, very queeny Mexican, possibly Filipino guy. Yeah. With no background in porn. No. And do you know anything about his background beyond that? Um, so Raquel Welch is maybe personal assistant. That was a story he told. Right. And do we know? I mean, do you know? We don't know where he's from. We don't know where he grew up. We don't know anything about his. He's disappeared. So when right, and he's disappeared recently, like in yeah. the last ten years or so. In the last since probably like seven or eight years. Yeah. John Waters interviewed him, and he was living in like near Joshua Tree, mm -hmm. uh, near Twenty Nine Palms, because there's a Marine base there. Yep. But he was living with. An assortment of animals in like, <laughs> um, like with, he said it was kind of like a fancy chicken coop where he like was living with, you know, I don't know. I can't even remember what animals, but it was a ton of different animals and animal feces all over the floor. Yeah. When you, and, when you originally told me this story, I just, I, I still, it just haunted me ever since. So he, he kind of rose to a certain point fame from for a moment there yeah. this is all in the 90s right when he's doing the gay porn mm -hmm. the gay marine porn at least among gay men probably he was an important figure and maybe even a celebrity right because apparently this was quite popular it was kind of underground popular it wasn't mm -hmm. mainstream so um and another guy was doing it at the same time whose name is dirk yates do you want to hear about dirk well, of yates? course what a name first of all so Dirk Yates, and that's his birth name. That's his real name. No, no, no. Oh, his okay. real name's, uh, I think it's Rick Ford. Okay, and and he's great too because he also seduced all these Marines. And my friend Frank like adored his videos for years. And we drove down to meet him. So Dirk was in San Diego, right? He's in San Diego, which yeah. is so very convenient when you're interested in, in Marines. Yeah, and Dirk, and he was gay, and he was gay. He was from LA originally. And he moved to San Diego because he loved Marines. And, you know, and what's interesting is Dirk said, and a couple of the older guys said to me, they said the worst thing that ever happened is gay liberation movement. Mm. They said before yeah. that, you could have sex with a man. That's right. And not think about your identity. Mm -hmm. There was no identity politics. So if you're a Marine and you end up getting, having sex with men regularly... You don't go like, oh, God, am I gay? What's my family going to think? Am I gay? There was actually no cognition mm. of this dichotomy. Yeah, that's it. And so he said he would have sex with two Marines every day. It was like the easiest thing. You say to a Marine, hey, do you want to get a blowjob? And they're like, sure. And, um, and you know, the Marines have a saying, like, a mouth is a mouth. Actually, David Allen Coe, this country singer, uh -huh. I'm – developing a documentary with johnny knoxville on he spent 20 years in prison and he said the same thing he goes a mouth's a mouth you know there's a point there yeah mm -hmm. you know it's not like you know so um and uh and people didn't think about it you know and it didn't i mean i think in some cultures there's the, very much the, like the giver or the receiver rule um but uh i mean it's just kind of crazy i mean i i got all the way back to like the first awareness of like gay, the first it was during World War One, I, I believe. The first movement, like we have to worry about gay people seducing our soldiers, right. 
um, I think happened during World War One, and um, and there's actually all these crazy stories where these guys would go to, to like YMCA's and different places where like or like bathrooms, and they were like undercover cops for the for the army. Yep, and they were trying to arrest guys who were giving other guys blowjobs. The craziest thing, though, is you can actually look at the trial transcripts from back in 1917, and in their wording of the time, they'd be like, I met this other man. I thought he might be a homosexual. He signaled to go into the bathroom stall. I went in with him. I unzipped my pants. Um, I took my penis out, and he began to blow it, and then I arrested him. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's like, right. It was just like, so there was like this whole thing like, there wasn't in a word <laughs> that yeah. it's entrapment, but the guys were also like putting their penises in other men's mouths and then be like, this is horrible. I must have told you about George Chauncey and you must be getting a lot of this from him. The historian. The no. Great, okay. You might, I think I'm sure I told, I had to have told you about him 10 years ago when we first yeah. met about this. Yeah. He, oh. you must have read this. George, yeah. George Chauncey. Yeah. So George, that like Yale or something. Yes. Yeah. George Chauncey is basically the best sort of historian of, gay men in America. And he's, he's written, he was one of the best social historians, period. Yeah. His book, Gay New York, is one of my very favorite books. But he had um, another article in, I think this is also in Gay New York, but it's a separate article about that. I think it was called The Social Hygiene Movement of World yeah. War One. And you're completely correct in everything mm -hmm. you're saying. Yeah. It was a deliberate top-down attempt by the White House and the, and, uh, the War Department to eliminate this scourge of homosexuals <laughs> and of prostitutes. Yeah. And both, yeah, both yeah. prostitutes and, and homosexuals were just rounded up yeah, and thrown in prison yeah. during the war, yeah. and it's something that people don't talk about or even or, or even aware of. It was you know one of the grossest violations of civil liberties and civil rights in American history, yeah. and it was targeting directly these people. Not Woodrow Wilson, no, good old progressive Woodrow. <laughs> well, you got to fight the war, you know. You can't have these Not fags the running around, of Princeton, <laughs> blowing your Marines' dicks, you know. Yeah. Um, so, all right, I want it the. Yeah, so much to unpack here. And I'm still like thinking, what the hell did I not have you on earlier? But so uh, the characters in this story yeah. are so great. So we have basically there's like three main characters. There's there's Bobby Garcia, yeah. who we've talked about. Dirk Yates. There's Dirk Yates in San Diego. And we'll get to the third character in a minute. But so Bobby's doing his thing. He's in San Diego at the time in the 90s when he starts doing the, it's the San Diego Oceanside area. And they, yeah. But he didn't know Dirk at first. They were doing it independently. They kind of, it's early on they met. I, so, I'm not sure. But Bobby starts making the videos, and Dirk's he, kind of making videos too. And then they find each other, and they start and working they, together. And Dirk starts distributing stuff. So Dirk, let me give you his great backstory. Dirk has all these dirty movie theaters, or you know, dirty bookstores. Um, That's what he. That was his main occupation. He owned adult bookstores. He owned adult bookstores beginning in like the 70s in San Diego. Or? I'm not sure what year, but he yeah. had them. Okay. And um and. Uh, and basically, the Marines would come in to, like, go in the jerk-off booths, the peep show booths, or buy the magazines or, you know, the videos. And um, and it's it's all Ron Jeremy's fault is for everything. Um, for the three of you listening who don't know who Ron Jeremy was, <laughs> who was Ron Jeremy? <laughs> Ron Jeremy was the great Jewish hope in porn. Um, so he was... Um, I'm trying to expand my female audience. So, yeah. you know, it's good. And so we might have some female listeners and some possibly some men who don't know who he was. But yeah, he was like the most famous, probably porn male porn actor in the what, like 80s, 80s and 90s yeah, yeah. after John Holmes, the hedgehog. Yeah. So he started off late 70s, this Jewish guy who wanted to be an actor. Um, and uh, he was kind of fine looking in like a 70s kind of mustached way. Mm -hmm. And um, and an enormous penis. And um and the worst sense of humor, like the most like sticky grandpa Jewish jokes, um, and um, but everyone kind of just loved because he's such a schlub. And then basically, in his autobiography, he talks about how he started going to Plato's Retreat, which is the most like the Studio Fifty Four, the most famous sex club. And instead of all the sex he could have, he found out that they had a buffet. And <laughs> it was a big eater. Ron loved his food. And he ballooned up a ton because he was going to sex clubs every night, but eating the buffet and then like getting a little sex in. But he's a man of extravagant appetites. Indeed. And, and lately he's been accused of a bunch of 
Me Too type stuff. So mm. that's later. But so why is it all Ron Jeremy's fault? So Ron, so the Marines, Ron Jeremy was the go-to guy in every porno movie in the '80s mm-hmm. and '90s. He could always get it hard on, and he got fatter and fatter and less attractive. And um, and the Marines were like, "Why?" They said to Dirk, "Why does every porno have this goddamn?" Ron Jeremy in it. <laughs> Why can't they have good looking guys like us Marines, like young guys who are buff? Why can't someone make porno with people like us? And Dirk said, I think they've got a point. Mm-hmm. And so he put together a bunch of his savings and decided to make a porno with Marines fucking Valley Girl porno stars. So he wrote a script because back then porno had plots. Mm-hmm. And he hired two well-known porn actresses to come down to San Diego and cast a couple of Marines. And as they start shooting the porno scenes, the Marines are like, oh, but, 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 the, the, the porn stars, there's real porn stars in the room. I can't believe it. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And they could not get it up. Uh-huh. Of course. <laughs> and he'd spend all his money. Because they were amateurs. Because they were not. Unlike Ron. Jeremy. Unlike Ron. That's right. And he was like, what the fuck? And... And he lost all his money because he couldn't do anything with these Marines because they got too nervous around these girls. So then he like was like, like two other Marines go like, well, give us a chance. And he was like, okay, same thing. And then like another Marine said, I could do it. And he said, why don't we just shoot video of you masturbating to see if you can really, you know, we'll do like the beginning lesson before we go to like, you right. know, like a, Carnegie Hall. Like an audition. Yeah. <laughs> Make sure you can do it. Yeah. Like, you know, you're not going to be nervous around a camera. And he shot a couple of these Marines just masturbating. And his friends heard about it. And they were like, this is the greatest thing ever. Can we see it? And he was like, and they were like, why are you trying to do straight Marines having sex with girls? Let's just do straight Marines masturbating tapes. And he was like, oh. (laughs) And those started selling. So that's concurrent with Bobby. So they eventually meet up. Um and Bobby starts distributing, and Dirk starts distributing Bobby's stuff, which he's, Bobby's Bobby's not a businessman. He's just a full-on fetishist. He doesn't care if there's money or not. So um, so he started distributing stuff. Um, and, you know, sales were okay. They weren't, like, great. And then here's the crazy thing that happened is um, one of the Marines is, because it's, all these Marines were just coming over to Bobby's to party and drink his beer and play. He had video games and stuff, whatever, and low jobs. And one of the Marines' wives found out about this, mm. showed up at Bobby's house, um, screamed at Bobby, like, you know, screamed at her, maybe her husband was there. I can't remember exactly. Found a box on Bobby's like kitchen table with hundreds of pictures of Marines. Um, Polaroids of them masturbating. She stole it and she took it to the Marines and said, you need to investigate this. Um, all these Marines are masturbating and are in gay porno. And the Marines, and this is before, I think it's even before Don't Ask, it's before Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Mm-hmm. You could be kicked out of the Marines for any act of you know gay sexuality. Um, and the Marines did what they, you know, really do do in these cases, they go, listen, we've got cannon fodder here that's dumb and ready to <laughs> die. That's right. We're not going to do anything. And they did nothing. And so she got pissed and she went to the San Diego police. And the San Diego police were like, well, what do you want us to do? These guys are all of age. You know, they're not, you know, they're Marines. Or they're, and, um, and the San Diego police did nothing. But one of the police called the local reporter and told him the story because he thought it was like a juicy story. And this story boomed because it was a dead news week. And suddenly it became the Marine porn scandal of like 90 something. Um, it was, and um, wasn't it on like NBC news? It was all? top story, like, yeah, top night story. news, nightly Tom news. Brokaw's reporting on it. No, Tom Brokaw is like Marine porn scandal, you know, um, and everyone freaks out. And um, and Bobby disappears for the first time. And Dirk basically is like, well, this is the end of it. He like shuts down his shop and is getting ready to go out of town. And um, 
and doesn't know what to do. And Bobby's gone. But then he it's just like he thinks his business is gone. Um, but he gives like, but then suddenly one day he goes to work thinking it's going to, he's done. And basically every person who's ever thought about <laughs> Marines might be hot across America has seen Dan Rather and Tom Brokoff advertising his porn and the calls are crazy. And so great. And everyone wants to buy this across America who didn't know about it before. And suddenly he becomes, starts selling like crazy and starts making money hand over foot and or hand over fist, whatever it uh, is. Uh, or hand, or over hand, hand over something else. Yeah, yeah, hand over cock. And he ends up becoming eventually super wealthy and becomes the most successful gay porn uh, director and producer, thanks to Tom Brokoff. Of all time. Of all time. Wow. This is Dirk. Dark. He yeah. makes them, you know, he starts doing scripted gay porn too. He does some straight porn. He does the most expensive gay porn ever, which was How the West Was Hung, a cowboy thing where he like hired horses and like <laughs> rented a Western town. Um, and geniusly enough, just as the internet was coming out, he sold the whole company before the internet killed mm. it. Mm. So he like cashed out the right time. Nice. Um, so. Um, so he's a national hero. He's, yeah, he's like you know. I'm thinking. I was just thinking when you were ta talking about it becoming a news story. I'm thinking like, what was in the minds of you know the Marine Corps of NBC News and CBS and Dan Rather and the general public about this? Right? What was the problem? Right? Because they weren't doing anything really illegal. Well, it was illegal mm. to be a Marine and within them within with, the core within the core. It was illegal. it's still illegal to do porno if you're in the core straight okay. or gay. Yeah. Okay. But it was totally, but you, yeah, you'd I, get kicked out for having gay sex. Right. Okay. So that's okay. But it's sort of like, so what's the, you know what I mean? Like, what were they thinking? What's the problem here? Right. Cause the problem is that a bunch of your boys yeah. don't mind having sex with men. Yeah. Right. And so what are you going to do about forbid. that? Like, what does that mean? Now, now what do we do as a nation for the, you know, yeah. Um, I'm just thinking, like, what, how are they? How, are how will they kill this? people? How yeah. will they kill people like, if they're what, thinking about cock? Yeah, like, yeah. What's the problem here? I was thinking, you know, for Americans, like, what's you know, your Marines like to fuck each other? Okay. This episode is brought to you by the Unregistered Underground, the Unregistered Podcast Supporting Listeners Group. For me, the Underground is much more than that. It has become my community, a place where I can talk to people about all sorts of ideas and about our lives. As you can tell from this sample from a recent Ask Me Anything session I did for members of the Underground. How different do you think your conversation with Marvin Much would have been if at the start of your meeting he had confessed to you that he had actually committed the crime he was accused of? I'm curious of why we're not using more linguistic framing. You know, so linguists are looking at this from a descriptive rather than a prescriptive realm. So generally, right? Why aren't we framing it more in that the, the aspect of semantic range and cultural agreement? What's your problem with academia? Like they have nothing but theories and they have no political power. How does the notion of autonomy or agency play into that? I can't pinpoint if there's a contradiction. It's just I do think it's interesting in relation to ideas about responsibility, about autonomy, and then especially about where you and Heidi really delve into agency and law. At wearing your postmodern hat, how do you define the individual or the self? Oh, wait a second. My postmodern hat? Wear whatever hat you want, but that was the question. <laughs> That's that's your perspective that it's backwards, right? <laughs> it's not, you know, how do you know this isn't forward? I'll be doing another Ask Me Anything session for members of the Unregistered Underground on Wednesday, November 28th at 5.30 p.m. Pacific Time, 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time. If you become a member of the Unregistered Underground, you can participate in these AMA sessions, and you'll also get access to our private Facebook group, as well as discounts on Renegade University courses and merchandise. To become a supporting listener of this podcast and a member of the unregistered community, go to unregisteredunderground.com. And then Bobby kind of, he and Dirk have a falling out. Bobby has to move way out to the desert, lives in this shithole, and then ends up disappearing, basically, right? Bobby kind of burnt all his bridges. Like, yeah. he was someone who was always, yeah, he would, you know, he was not the most moral guy. Ethical. Right. 
I don't know the difference between ethics and morals. But when was he last cited? John Waters was the last one to cite him. Mm-hmm. So, um, and I reached out to John, and he didn't. It was many years ago. He's, yeah, he's been missing for many years. Yeah, and I've put lots of feelers out, and no one seems to know. He has a few nom de mm-hmm. plumes or mm-hmm. horns or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, Bobby Garcia is not his real name. So we found out his real name and mm. tried to track him down, and still can't. We couldn't. No, I mean that's amazing. In, if this, I, in this day and age, to not be able to find somebody. Well. Bobby Garcia, the name is a little common. It's, well, you know his real name. Yeah, but it's also a common name. It's like, oh, okay. It's like, it's another like. I would. I'm dying to find him and get him on this show. I would love to talk to Bobby. Well, I could get you. You know, Rob Navarro, who was the third great character. The in third the story. great character in the story. Um, yeah, so Rob was like sort of the opposite of Bobby. He's kind of. Except for the gay porn part. <laughs> he kind of took Dirk and Bobby and combined the two and took it to a different place. So Rob's story is incredible because Rob was, um, his parents were immigrants, um, Latino immigrants who came to Pasadena. They converted to um, a fundamental, I think. Seventh day Adventist. Seventh day Adventist. Yeah. I have some friends from that church, yeah. That's a that's a hardcore church. Yeah, that's a church that believes apocalypse is happening pretty damn soon. Mm-hmm. So they don't believe in going to, uh, going to like college because why bother? And you know, it's a very but they also work very hard. And um, and so he was raised in that, and always loved singing. And he started singing and getting noticed. And he ended up becoming kind of the uh uh well, i'm spacing on his name ricky um oh ricky martin the the because christian music always finds the christian version of secular music mm-hmm. so he was marketed as the christian's ricky martin right and he's super cute talented and and so he very like you know, very synth heavy, like very slick music, like Ricky Martin, but Christian. And, and so he took off doing that. And then, um, and then he even got invited to join the heritage singers who are like this real old time classic Christian vocal group. Um, and, you know, and he told us, of course, a few of the other guys <laughs> were gay, you know, because, you know, that's, the nature of not surprising yeah. yeah um and but he kept trying to be straight and then um one night one of his a cousin by marriage not by birth you know not a blood relative got him drunk a week before he's supposed to get married and this cousin happened to be a sailor mm-hmm. and seduced him and suddenly he goes oh i'm not really into girls i'm into boys mm-hmm. and you know, he'd had long-term girlfriends, but never wanted to have sex with them because, and they were all Christian girls too, but they wanted to have sex because that's what Christian girls do. Um, and uh, and so he wrestled with it and eventually came to terms, but his career was Christian music. So he wanted to keep doing it. He had a sister who was always jealous of him because everyone called her Rob's sister, never her own name. <laughs> And so when she found out he was gay and secret about it, she went and outed him. Man, these women, what's going on? Yeah. And um, and uh, so he ended up becoming, leaving Christian music and becoming an actor. And he took off for a while. He was the voice of Ronald McDonald for all of South America. <laughs> um, he was getting TV work. He was also doing real estate. He moved to West Hollywood and he did therapy and dealt with it um but then he discovered bobby garcia tapes Mm. and he was like oh my fucking god this is the greatest thing ever so he started going down to oceanside also and um and he's good looking and he's really cute like he's kind of like super good looking charismatic charismatic and really good at giving head and give yes Right. Should we get to that? Or Please. Right? So for those of you uh, with children around, make sure they listen to this. Yeah. <laughs> so when I, you know, 
you know, he talks about how amazing he is at giving head. And and I was like, oh, you know. So I haven't seen it. You have. Yeah. And you describe it pretty well in an article you've written about yeah. it. Go ahead. So basically, when you, <laughs> you know, you know, you're like, uh, you know, there you can think of varieties in giving head. And obviously there's people who's terrible at it. And mm-hmm. there's people who are good at it. But you're like, how good can they be? Well, I decided to watch this and um how, how good could it be right like <laughs> and you watch him and he's trying to give this guy a blow job and you're like well, it looks like a blow job and and so what they do a lot of times is so they'll put the male the marine in a chair or on, a, on the bed and behind bobby's head or rob's head is straight pornos playing so the guys oh. can disassociate and watch yeah. the straight porno and so watching the first scene with rob you see the guy's not looking at rob at all he's not wanting to think about rob he's watching some porno and trying to focus on that mm-hmm. and rob's just giving this blow job and then suddenly i don't know what it is but it's one of these things where like like a dodge dart turns into a lamborghini <laughs> and you know like like i don't know if you were like the Ch- charlie jan the chan family had that car that like could turn into anything mm-hmm. it was like like something from a cartoon and his hand moves one way and his head moves like 14 other ways. Like, you know, like his head is moving like in ways that you didn't know, like the, the vertebrae could go. And, and it just moves into like 150 miles per hour. And, and the Marine who's trying to watch the porno just suddenly looks down and has this look like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> and you see like his toes curl and his feet rise and he's just starts watching Rob and, in utter disbelief and and rob does give probably the greatest blow job on earth um and the guy comes really quickly i i mean i interviewed one marine and he's like listen i'm just straight i did it for the money i mean i like rob he's a good guy and i go but is it true he gets the best blow job in the world he goes uh yeah he goes i gotta tell you i'm sometimes with girls and they're giving me head and it's not working, and I have to think back to Rob to get off. <laughs> there it is, people. The gay agenda. Yeah. Successful. He's converted. They've, they've taken person. our men, <laughs> our best men. That, so, oh boy. So, Rob. I make, it makes me want to go look at it, but it also makes me not want to go look at it. I'm, uh, I'm curious, but I'm not sure how curious. <laughs> There's my homophobia peeking out there, I guess. Uh, well, you should watch it. Yeah, um, I should watch it. I've watched one gay porn. Uh, a long time ago, it was shocking uh-huh. in how it, I mean, I don't know if, how representative it is of gay porn, but at how um, kind of rough and brutal and domineering the sex was. Uh-huh. It's kind of like within within straight porn, it would be considered, you know, re- regular porn, but sort of of the extreme variety. Uh-huh. It was like a lot of like dick slapping on the face and like, you know, <laughs> a lot of sort of humiliation and domination and stuff like that but um it's um so this is just it's i love this project so in so many ways and one of the ways in which i love it is that i still can't quite understand what's going on here like i don't have you know i'm mr theory for everything i don't really i have a few kind of vague hypotheses about why what's going on here but i don't really you you have you have some too what, what, what do you and, make of this? So we're, we have a lot. Let's just make sure we're clear here. Like we have hundreds and hundreds, probably thousands, right, of Marines oh, yeah, have done so this. Oh, yeah, so many, yeah. So thousands of U.S. Marines have done this. Yeah. Okay, straight guys. Yeah. It's amazing. And videotaped. And then the videotapes are sold, right? Yeah. So it's in public. It's in the public. You can go. I was just thinking. Right. They're not like, oh, God, I hope no one finds out. Like, right. like I, one time I tried this. They're right. like, okay, this is. And, and yeah. I can go, you know, someone's daughter could go find a picture of them having sex with Rob Navarro or yeah. Robbie Garcia, yeah. you know, um, and I wonder about that, right? I mean, yeah. how many of those guys have been sort of found out by family members, right? The, the interesting thing is like one of them was just like, he told people that, uh, girls this, as a seduction technique. And like girls would be like, oh, he's edgy. Oh, really? Yeah. And though apparently his girlfriend later got jealous. It was like, you're not going to do that anymore. Um, really yeah. jealous because they thought the head was their, their head wasn't as good. Yeah. It couldn't compete with Rob. So no, no, it's very interesting. And, um, 
and I worked years ago. I did sound on a few porno movies that a gay porno movies oh, that yeah? my friend directed, and it was interesting because like there would be these porno stars, like there was one who's like this really muscly guy, and like as soon as the cameras, I'm like the sound man, right? Like I'm, you know, he's just like, just so you know, dude, I'm straight. Really? Yeah. He's like, I've got, I'm dating right now twins, identical twins. <laughs> just so you know, dude. Yeah, and I'm like, uh. Sure, like go back to sucking cock and then, you know, whatever. <laughs> and there's a lot of straight guys, straight identified, who do gay porn, gay for pay, it's called. So, yeah, it raises so many questions about everything. Yeah, because, everything. Because, and the big thing is, for women, it doesn't raise questions, right? If you go to hmm. a liberal arts college... Right. Every woman mm, oh, yeah. has a little, you know, lesbian till graduation moment. Mm -hmm. And no one's just like, oh, what does that mean? Why did she do that? That's right. And so, I mean, to me, it's pretty clear. It's just a lot more people are on the spe the Kinsey spectrum. Correct. Right. And, you know. In other words, it's not a binary. Right. So Kinsey, right. Kinsey in the 40s and 50s sort of demolished the binary. And so there's a spectrum yeah. and, and you can sort of whether it's one to 10 or one to 100, you know, you're somewhere there between yeah, I think pure hetero and pure homo. Right. Like one is completely hetero. Ten is completely gay. Right. And some people are twos. Some people are eight. Some people are seven. And I think I think Kinsey said that virtually no one is is a, is pure homo or pure pure hetero. Right. That right. We're all sort of somewhere in the middle or in between. Right? Yeah. Um, Okay. Well, there's that. And that makes sense, especially it's a great comparison when you talk about women, right? Because yeah. you're right. It, the binary is not enforced oddly yeah. among women as much as it is among men. No, because men all think two women having sex is hot. Yeah. If you've ever sucked dick or had your dick sucked or in any way did any gay sex, you're gay. Right. You're gay. Yeah. You're not heterosexual. You're different. Right. You're fundamentally different sexually than me. Yeah. Yeah. And when I was in college, you know... Uh, no, in grad school, I'm by you know I I was fooling around with a guy for a while, and um and I was like oh I'm going to art school it's time to have you know sex with a guy and um <laughs> right. and uh and when I you know started fooling around with a girl also all the gay guys were like you need to come out of the closet and deal with it mm. and I was just like no actually I, I also had sex with guys when I was like you know 16. I've dealt with it. I'm like, you know, occasionally into guys, but mostly into girls. I'm like, I like, you know, experimenting. And they were all, they were like, no, you're a closet case and you need to come out. I'm like, I'm out of the closet. So the gays were enforcing the binary. Also, with you. yeah, they like took it as like hmm. a slap in the face. Yeah. So I don't think, it, I think the culture has changed a lot since then yeah. because so I, I know I told you this yeah. before. So here's the history that, yeah. that I know yeah. that's relevant. Okay. So George Chauncey, it's all from mm. mostly from George Chauncey. So according to him, and there's massive evidence in his book, it's called Gay New York, by the way. Yeah. Everyone should go read it. It's truly one of the best histories I've ever read. According to him, until World War II-ish, maybe the 1930s, but around then, um, there was a flourishing, vibrant gay subculture in New York City and in other cities as well. He focuses on New York, sort of beginning in the 1890s. With industrialization, everybody moves to the cities, and then right, if you're gay yeah. on the farm, you can't do anything about it. But yeah. when you move people into cities, then they have opportunities, right? They were doing it on the farm too. They yes. were doing it on the farm. Well, having spent a lot of time in West Virginia, sure, but there's, there's just less opportunity. Yeah, there's yeah. a lot, but with fewer yeah. choices, right? So, um, so obviously, at the turn of the century, you have this just eruption, emergence, emergence of a gay subculture. But according to Chauncey, the most interesting thing is that what he found was a lot of fluidity and no binary and yeah. that between gay and straight and there were multiple categories that were employed during mm -hmm. that time by the society in, at large and by the gay subculture so there were fairies and wolves and queens <laughs> and yeah. fags and they all had different meanings yeah some of them meant you could you were a heterosexual man who like you mm -hmm. had basically a heterosexual man who occasionally had sex with a man yeah and that was an accepted category yeah for a lot of men you could go back and forth and still be considered straight yeah Right. Then, according to Chauncey, 1930s, 1940s happens. Uh, the war happens. 
prohibition had just happened and there's a lot of sort of regulation by the government. Yeah. He, Chauncey doesn't quite identify it as clearly as I do, but it's the Roosevelt <laughs> administration. It's <laughs> it's progressivism. It is. It's just um, progressive regulation gets really tight in the 1930s. Yeah. And especially and even more so during the war. Yeah. And that's when the binary becomes totally enforced. Yeah. And it's like you're either straight or you're gay and that's it. Yeah. And to Corinne, Corinne and Chauncey, that was the invention of the closet. Uh-huh. As a matter of fact, because there's met that's shame. That shame becomes much more powerful then. Yeah. Right. Because being gay is also bad. Yeah. Clearly bad. And being straight is clearly good. And you're just one or the other. You're either a saint or a devil. Yeah. Well, and going back further, I mean, the term homosexual was only invented like 1870 or 1860. Exactly. Or something. Right. But, um, by psychologists during like, you know, the, everyone was trying or psychiatrists, they were trying yep. to like categorize. We have to categorize every plant and every human and make sense of it. And before that, there wasn't even a concept called homosexual. There was a exactly. concept called sodomy. Mm-hmm. And if you, and I can't remember what book I read all about this in, but basically heterosexual sodomy was just as bad as homosexual sodomy. There was no distinction. Mm-hmm. Exactly. If you're getting a blowjob from a woman, that's horrible too, because sex is procreative. Right. That's its purpose. And if you're getting any kind of not any kind of non-procreative sex, is going to lead you to burn in hell. That's right. And so anyone who did any of that kind of stuff in Puritan societies or something, homosexual or straight, is a sodomite and needs to be extinguished. Right. Sexuality or sexual preference moved from just an act or or a series of acts to becoming an identity, becoming an identity, a fixed identity. This is actually in many ways the origins of identity politics in this country. It's part of it, right? Yeah. But it's not good. Yeah. Uh, it was much, I think, and I think you agree, that it's far better and freer to live in a society in which it's fluid. It's like we yeah. don't care and you can be this one minute and something else the next minute. You can yeah. be gay now and straight the next minute. So so I think what's happening here with your story with the Marines is we're talking about the early 90s. We're talking about very young guys, probably uneducated guys generally. They, yeah. have, they have not read George Chauncey. They're not aware of the, <laughs> <laughs> the, the uh, social construct of, they the, read a lot of, of the gender yeah. binary. Yeah. yeah, no. They read a lot of Foucault. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And so I would imagine they are essentially culturally and in terms of knowledge just many decades behind a lot of other people who like live in cities and go to colleges and are have, you know, they just yeah. haven't been around gay people, haven't been around gay subculture. So they're sort of like, in a sense, they are from the the 19th century before homosexuality was invented mm-hmm. as a category and before the binary was invented. So they're simply kind of unaware in mm-hmm. some ways is kind of what you're saying, right? The yeah. cognition issue. Yeah. Um, they're kind of on some level unaware, I guess, of what this means. And, you know, and, and if we get into the wild whites, I'll get into a little of this too. There's also this whole like, and I think this is part of, everything going on in America, if I know you and I like you, you're acceptable. So once they got to know Bobby and Rob, they're like, oh, you you, you know, like that whole racist trope where someone says to a black person, well, you're not like other black people. It's like, that's because I'm the only black person you know. So, right. so you associate me with like, oh, yes, I am a normal human being. And like, so once they get to know Bobby and Rob, they're like, oh, I really like Rob. Mm -hmm. And they're like, so he's not like the other gay people. Yeah. And he's not like those fags. Yeah. Right. And, um, and the truth of the matter is these guys build strong bonds with the Marines. Like the Marines, like Dirk would tell me like Marines would come like 20 years later and have Thanksgiving with them. Amazing. Um, another, guy who did this porn told me like he got a call from this guy like he'd done a movie with two years earlier and he was like in colorado or somewhere somewhere and he just called him he's like um you're the only one i could talk to i'm thinking of killing myself tonight can you talk me out of it and he's like what (laughs) i haven't seen you in two years he's like but he represented like empathy and warmness and kindness there you go and that's it and oh that's it yeah, and these men gave them things that other men could not, that they needed, that they wanted. Yeah, that only w- some women could give them. Yeah, but men most, and that's I think that's why I am attracted to gay men, mm-hmm. and always have been, yeah. because they give me that emotional intelligence and warmth and openness that I don't get from straight men. Yeah, 
right? And that's, I think that's, and, and sort of their creativity and just the openness yeah. and, and emotional availability, yeah. I think is why I've always, always loved gay men and gay male culture. Yeah. And I think that's probably, and it hadn't occurred to me until you just said that, but yeah. I, that must have been part of why the Marines were attracted to these guys. I don't know about with Bobby, but <laughs> well, yeah, Bobby's a special case. That's, Bob, that seemed more like a hit and run. Right? I, I mean, I know people kept hanging out with Bobby. Did they? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, but um, that's amazing. But I know also people did beat up Bobby because he was oh, really? unscrupulous. Rob has good relationships. They, were like, be, they beat him up over like him stealing money or something. Not about the fact that I don't think he ever stole money, but just. But it wasn't like I'm. I, in other words, the what you were expecting to happen, and most people watching this, yeah, expecting to happen, didn't happen. It's not they didn't beat him up because they were like you fag you. No, no, no. It wasn't that. It was right. It was later, like you pissed him off. Gotcha. So, but yeah, Rob, I've I've gone there and like you know like, oh, this Marine's taking a break from his wife and like visiting for a week just to hang out. It's amazing. And um, yeah, the one guy like you know who got the suicide call was just like. I was like, isn't there like a psychologist with the Marines you could talk to? You know, isn't there someone in the Marines? Like, and he's like Googling how to talk someone out of suicide. He's like, no, no, no. I like you best. Wow. And, you know, and, and was it, I think it was Dirk who said like, you know, he's got like guys from 20 years earlier who are married and have kids. And like, they come down for like, a couple of days a year just to hang out and, and sometimes have sex. If we could just give them all George Chauncey's book, you know, they would all make, be able to make sense of it and begin a revolution to demolish the gender binary, the sexuality binary. The, um, I, and wait, and just speaking of that, the interesting thing is when I talked to Rob recently, he said like 10 or 20 years ago, it was really a seduction thing. Like you really, it was money and seduction, but he said, the binary is so broken down already. Like a lot of guys. Oh yeah, that's right. Are just like, they don't have the stigma that 10 or 20 years ago, they were like, okay. They were like, and, um, hmm. and it used to be like him giving them blow jobs and then like occasionally letting them fuck him. And he's finding these young Marines now are like, well, do you want to fuck me too? Jeez. And, and they're just totally open to the whole experience. But, his older audience, which was like the older gay guys, they had a whole thing. And this is the interesting thing is their whole thing was they like crossing the boundary, like seducing the straight guy. And if the straight guy lets himself get fucked, they go, oh, he was gay the whole time. This sucks. So for a long time, even if a Marine wanted to get fucked, because apparently Marines are known for loving to have stuff in their butt. Um, oh really? Yeah. Like other than penises, what do they like uh, to have? Strap-ons. You know, they're well, what? This is a thing among Marines. Yeah, yeah. Like there's a whole like there's a writer named Stephen Zealand who writes about Marine sexuality and <laughs> talks about like there's there's guys who move to Marine towns and um, and they will get a buzz cut and start looking like Marines, but they're not Marines because they want to have sex with Marines. But there's also women who fetishize Marines and move to these towns to have sex with the Marines. And the one and he interviews one of the women who's a Marine fetishist. And she's like, Yeah, they love strap ons. So Maybe this is why they're now relying on special operations forces more. Because the <laughs> Marines like are not as, water. Yeah, yeah, they're not as trustworthy. <laughs> well, the thing is, here's here's the the real tr truth about Marines. You know, people think of them as this certain thing, but the truth of the Marines is they're wild asses. Yeah. They are people who are like, I want to be challenged in every way. Like the one, one of the Marines I talked to, he apparently like, you know, tested his IQ or whatever. When he entered the Marines, they're like, you've tested 99th percentile. In intelligence? In intelligence. Uh -huh. We're going to put you in intelligence. We're going to teach you languages. Um, you're never going to have to put on a uniform. You're never going to risk getting your legs blown off or anything else. And, um, and you're going to have like, the cushiest career. And he was like, but I grew up watching Rambo. I want to be on the front lines killing people. They're like, but you could be killed. <laughs> you could have this job. And he's like, no, no, but I want to be. And so they're, they are adrenaline attention junkies. Right. Right. Cause that's why they're part of why they're doing it. And so they're doing it because they're adrenaline attention junkies. And so when you're that kind of person, you want to try everything. 
you're just the kind of person who's like, I'll try killing someone. And like, well, if you're going to kill someone, why not just get a blowjob? <laughs> like how bad is getting a blowjob? Um, yeah, I guess. I mean, so they're also the paragons of masculinity, though. And so it's they're kind of trading, maybe because they're so secure in their masculinity, because this culture put, places them, them yeah. puts them in that position as yeah. the paragons, yeah. that they can do this. They can, they can cross that boundary as well. There's a, there is a U.S. military helicopter flying by our hotel when two of them, as, as we speak, they are two of them, and they're actually banking right toward the hotel. They are like, I could throw a rock and hit those right now. I think they know yeah. what's going on here. So, so here's so and wait, let me tell you one more yeah, thing. Yeah, okay, yeah. When I talked to Rob and this other Marine recently, he said, you know, because now everyone has internet porn, and because of internet porn, you can explore every weird fantasy of yours, right? Before you had to go to a video store, oh, right? Someone would judge you if you're like renting That's stuff, right. yeah. And um, but now you can watch in the comfort of your home any kind of porn and explore anything you've ever thought about that's right and so everybody likes trans porn which on porn is called she male yeah it, it's it's a remarkably popular uh genre within porn yeah yeah she male mm -hmm. so um you said everyone likes she male but a lot of people do for sure he said every marine oh really? in the last few years oh no has had sex with a, what a trans woman this is a thing among marine marines every especially. marine he said every marine and and like the what? like this one marine I talked to is like the most conservative right wing marine. And Rob's like, you've had sex, you know? They call it she male. I don't. It's not my term. Um, and he goes, yeah, of course, everyone has. <laughs> He's like, it's hot. So I, I I'm speechless. I didn't know that part. That's I'm blown away. Yeah. Like what the hell? What do we do with that information? Well, we have to reimagine. You know, we have to move into the you know the future where sexuality is not. I guess we already, or I guess the Marines are. <laughs> they're storming the beaches of the sexual future. I think they're storming it, but they're not out about it. They're not like telling everyone yeah. about it. They're, they're not gonna... going back to like to Alabama and saying, "Mama, before we go to church tonight, I want to tell you something. I love tranny porn." You know. <laughs> so Marines are in practice queer. The whole thing's gay. The whole damn thing, apparently. I mean, if what who's, you're who's like, who were who the great armies of, of of like ancient times? The Spartans. Yeah. Like. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. Is yeah. that so? Here's the history that I know I told you when we first met about this. So the question is, okay, so we have established that at least to us and many people, there's a spectrum rather than a binary, and that almost everyone is sort of somewhere in between and so everyone has elements of both heterosexuality and homosexuality within them yeah. right okay but then the question is if you took sort of like just a random collection of american men yeah you know and put them in these circumstances how many of them would have fucked bobby in the ass right and right. i think my guess is few a, a smaller percentage than than the marines, than the marines yeah. right okay so we agree on that yeah so then the question is why in the military and that's what we're getting at here why is this such a thing in the military and i'll just so you talked about Sparta, right? Yeah. And, and Greece and ancient Greece and all that. Um, and the armies were deliberately homo social, certainly, yeah. and homo erotic as well. Right. Yeah. And it was encouraged to some extent, right? Because it was believed by yeah. many at the time that that would actually cause a, a bond to be formed between the men, which is essential yeah. for a, an effective fighting force. Yeah. You're going to be, if you're having sex with the other people you're fighting with, if someone tries to kill them. Yep. You're not going to run away when it gets scary. You're so, not going to be like, eh. you're going to be like, there's my, you know, and the Marines does it band of brothers. They try and create mm -hmm. this family structure to replace the sexual structure. Yeah. And so you have, and then the, so that falls away after the ancient era and the middle ages happen. And I mean, we don't, I mean, there's other things happening then, but I don't think it was encouraged. No, the Crusaders were known. Oh, were they? Yeah. The Crusade, when, um, when they brought down the Crusaders, um, uh, like the whole part of the big thing was the Crusaders were known to be super gay. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, no way. Yeah. Okay. I mean, again, it does make sense, though. So what I know is the U.S. history of this. And so in the Civil War and World War One, 
we just don't, I don't, I'm not aware of any information on this. I'm sure it was going on, yeah. but it wasn't encouraged. My point is that it wasn't encouraged or allowed. In fact, it was punished, as we said in World War One. right? Mm -hmm. They tried to eradicate right. the, the homosexual menace yeah. from the military during World War One. Then a new thing happens, though, with World War Two, which yeah. is a different story. And what happened in World War Two, which was a much bigger mobilization, just a huge number of men right in it created, the, the military barrack. created gay culture during exactly. World War II. Exactly. Bases and barracks, all these men together for the first time. And, you know, as I've said many times before, you know, ask a, ask a gay man in America who's over 60 what the greatest time in his life was. And almost certainly he will tell you it's World War Two. Yeah. Because a lot of gay, huge numbers of gay men and women yeah. um, were able to find, finally, large numbers of other gay people. Yeah through the military the what happened what's so interesting is that the army and the the war department discovered this and decided and we have them we have actual internal memos saying this deciding to not do anything about it to not exactly encourage it but to allow it to happen what they did essentially encourage and this is the the funniest thing mm -hmm. in the worst thing that's ever happened which was world war ii the funniest thing to me is that the most popular form of entertainment <laughs> at the at all the U.S. bases across the world during World War II was drag shows yeah, per performed by soldiers. When you cro cross the equator. What's that? When you cross the equator, you're supposed to draw, cross dressed. Do you know about that? No. Yeah, that was the, the custom. Is if you're on a warship, as you're crossing the equator, everyone on the ship would tr cross dress. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. So. so it was a mass phenomenon yeah. in World War II. And there have been several books written about this. This yeah. is, you know, well established. And we even have, we even have video, there's movies, even Hollywood movies showed yeah. some of this at the time. And so, and the, but the, the, the amazing thing is, as I said, the military and the White House allowed it and, yeah. and almost encouraged it because they understood that. And they, there's, we have some language at the time of them saying this. They understood that the that particular bond, that mm -hmm. homoerotic bond, actually made them more willing to fight and die for each other. Yeah. For each other. Yeah. So that's just a horrific monkey wrench for me in terms of my politics, right, mm -hmm. and my analysis, right? Because this is to me, this is the worst thing that's ever happened in humanity in the, in the history of humanity is World War II. Right. Um. And but I am a huge fan of gay culture and sexual freedom and liberation in general. So what I see going on among the men in those bases yeah. is phenomenal and subversive. Yeah. But at the same time, it's completely not. It is serving the interests of this war machine. So I don't even know what to do there. But we also know. But that all the and all the early gay leaders, the um, Mat Mattachine Society guys, yep, were all military guys. Correct. That's Except right. Except for. Um, uh, Harry Hay. Harry Hay was a communist. Yeah. So he was not, or he might have been. been old too old for the, I don't know. I don't know about Harry Hay, but yeah, uh, that whole generation. They all were as military I said, guys. Yeah. And they came out and they were like, they, they were like, we're, we fought in the war. We want our freedom. And they, uh, I'm spacing on his name. Um, he died a few years ago, but one of the leaders of the Mattachine Society. You're talking about the early gay, this is the in 1950s, the, the, the original gay political movement the first gay political movement country. was called the mattachine society right. and um and it was started by a bunch of military guys in los angeles in los angeles and there was dc chapter two. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah and um and some of them were people because during mccarthyism they also were ferreting out all gay people from from the military and and in the late 40s early 50s they started marching they called themselves homophiles not yep. homosexuals and they started marching outside the White House saying homophile rights and stuff. Mm -hmm. And you got to imagine the balls on those guys. Like, oh, yeah. I mean, like, it's insane. Oh, God, I'm spacing out his name. It's Frank something. Anyway. I, I think I know who you're talking about. Yeah. So the um, people wonder, often wonder, why is San Francisco the gay town? Yeah. Why is New York so gay? Why is yeah. Los Angeles so gay? Yeah. Well, the answer is the military. Yeah. Massive naval military bases yeah. in all those cities. Yeah. Treasure Island in the middle of the Bay Area, yeah. right? That's and and many others all over the Bay Area. And so right immediately after the war, all these gay bars and clubs opened in San Francisco because there were all these gay men in the military who were stationed there. And there was another thing which was crazy, which was um, if you like got kicked out of the military, I, I might be getting this a little wrong, but 
basically you'd be at like the Presidio in San Francisco. They'd give you a trial. They'd kick you off the military and they'd give you like just $10. And basically the streetcar line you could take from there. They'd be like, they'd be like, well, you're out of the military. You have no money. And the streetcar would take you only one place, Castro Street. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> and you'd be like, where do I go? I guess I'll live around here. And then eventually enough people started living around the Castro that it became also a gay center. So that, yeah, so I guess I'm just trying to... Wait, let me take you back a little okay. further. Yeah. I don't think I put this in the article. This was always something I want to get. It was Baron von Steuben. Do you know Baron von Steuben? Uh, slightly. Okay, so Baron von Steuben was a Prussian military officer mm -hmm, mm -hmm. under Frederick the Great, mm -hmm. who was gay mm -hmm. and was known for like having all his lovers and was, you know, the Prussian army was the best yep. army at the time, yep. 1770, 1760s, whatever. Well, apparently Baron von Steuben was a little too out there where like he, he was like just like fucking everything and out of control. And Frederick the Great was like, Baron von Steuben's out of control. Let's get the, him the fuck out of here. And they told him to leave. And where did he go? He went to Paris, you know, which is also a pretty fun place. And um, I don't, sorry, I'm just looking at my phone to make sure I get all this stuff right. But um, but so Baron von Steuben is hanging around in Paris and he loves the military and um, and uh, doesn't know, you know, you know, what to do now that he's not in the military and who comes to Paris at the exact same time? Benjamin Franklin. Oh, no. And Benjamin Franklin is working the French to get them to support the American Revolution. And they're like, okay, we really need help. And they're like, well, you can have Lafayette. And he's like, well, he's 19 years old or something. <laughs> like, can't you get us someone better? And they look around and they're like, oh, because they're not that into Baron von Steuben either. They want him out of Paris. They're like, we'll give you Baron von Steuben. And Baron von Steuben is like, well, what will you pay me to go there? And Ben Franklin's just like, we don't have any money. We're <laughs> fighting the British. We're broke. We're busy now. And the French were like, we will give, we will give it. Uh, no, I'm doing German. But they're just <laughs> like, we will pay Baron von Steuben to get out of Paris and go to America. And Baron von Steuben shows up with two of his lovers who are all their Prussian military guys and at George Washington's camp. And he looks around and the American army is just a fucking mess. Mm -hmm. It's all a bunch of guys like in rags with no shoes who basically fight when they want to. And then when they get bored, they go back to their farms. That's exactly right. I've, yeah. just, I've just been writing about that very thing. Washington yeah. could not keep his men under control at all. And he, the desertion rate was like 50% yeah. in the continental army. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, what people don't talk about was like Washington was a terrible general. He lost most of his battles. Um, the reason, as far as I understand, that Washington was made the general was of the, you know, Continental Army was he looked good. He really looked good on a horse. And they needed, once again, the South mm -hmm. to be on the side. And they're like, you know, uh, I mean, Gore Vidal, I think, says it should have been John, John Hancock. Who should have led the Continental Army, but they're like, it's just like, okay, well, it's like the Democratic Party. It's just like, we'll run another Southerner because that'll get us the South. And they were like, we got to get the Southern guy. Let's get George Washington. So um, von Steuben shows up there, and basically von Steuben starts training the American soldiers in Prussian military tactics. He writes the first, like, uh, what's it called, the Army. Like the manual? Manual, yeah. Uh, regulations for, yeah, the first, yeah, army manual, um, drill manual. Um, and he eventually becomes George Washington's chief of staff. Oh, my. And I did not know this. Or I knew this, but it didn't register in any significant way for me. Wow. And he basically came up with the idea of West Point. He designed West Point. Um, oh, he um, good idea. Yeah, he basically took Prussian military techniques and was like, okay, I have to alter these for these farmers and stuff who, like, you know, we're going to get rid of the extraneous, like, pomp and circumstance and just make it work. Mm -hmm. And most military historians say he's the second or third most important person for us winning mm -hmm. the, the the American Revolution. A gay German guy. And I was... Um, 
doing research into this and there's like a book from the 1870s um which is like a and von steuben just to show you how important he was though he's kind of forgotten now like saint patrick's day is the parade for all irish people um von steuben day was a day celebrated by germans if you remember ferris bueller's day off mm -hmm. there's a parade he joins with all these german music that's the von steuben day parade oh my. until world war ii all around the country, there was a Von Steuben Day, which was a German Pride Day. Um, <gasps> Dean Martin's from Steubenville, Ohio, named after Von Steuben. He's like he's like Lafayette, like he's one of these yeah. figures who like America honored with not lots of cities. The and stuff. military, would you say the whole thing is queer? The whole thing is queer, and he wrote the books. He invented West Point. Um, this book from the 1870s was like Von Steuben was a very strange man. He liked to have parties in his tents, um, where he told men to come not wearing trousers and would make alcoholic drinks that he lit on fire. I was like, he's having flaming daiquiris at like bottomless parties. And so. Um, I'm just struggling right now to like save my own politics. <laughs> I'm trying to think what to think here. Uh -huh. you know? In what way? I, 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 well, I mean, so, you know, I'm not a fan of the military and not a fan of certainly what the military in this country has done at all. Yeah. In fact, I hate it more than anything politically, <laughs> but I love queers and I love queerness yeah. more than anything. Yeah. And so I don't know what to do because I think you're completely right. Yeah. And it's a tough one. You know, it's, I guess, well, here's what I would say. So there've been two big moments, I think, and at least in American history yeah. where for, for, in terms of that were great mm. for gay subcultures yeah. or the gay subculture. One was, as I said, industrialization, capitalism, turn yeah. of the 20th century, bringing people into cities, right? Yeah. So that's all good and voluntary. No one's being forced yeah. to the point of a gun exactly. I mean, <laughs> by economic necessity, they are, but but they find good things. So that's, yeah, I, I like that generally, that process. Um, then, of course, it's it's forced upon them, you know, yeah. through conscription in World War II. And that's, yeah. that's a different way of creating a gay subculture, which I like less, although it was much more successful. And we are still living in that we are living in a society in which that gay subculture continued and ended up thriving and now has become a major legitimate part of the mainstream culture. And it also created like the forces for integration too. Indre that's true. Yeah. That's absolutely right. Yeah. It was one of the first integrated. And feminism. One of the first, yes, yeah. that's right. One of the first integrated institutions in the United States. And that's just true. Yeah. And also you're right. And it was one of the first institutions to allow women to rise in the ranks. Yeah. Well, and then the fact that all the men went off to war and the women worked oh, on the factories. Home front. Yep. Yep. Then suddenly all these women were forced to quit their jobs and be housewives and they started getting discontent and were like, hey, remember when I used to make my own money? I could do that. Yeah. And now there's a move I realized, I remembered that to, it's happening is to get women into the Marine Corps. Yeah. In fact, my niece um, is uh, wants to be in the Marines. Well, she's a teenager. Uh huh. In, in Berkeley, of all things. But yeah. <laughs> so, gosh. Um, so what else do we have? Is there any other theory to explain all this stuff or like make any I mean, I think it? it's, you know, unintended consequences, you know, like. That's you know. my, that's what I've always portrayed it as. Yeah. I'm wondering if there's more going on here that's not so great for my way of thinking about the world. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, like, you know, I was mentioning like, I worked on this thing with these baseball players i was like and these baseball players you're all, talking about you uh what was it the i worked on this tv show minor league baseball about like this below minor league baseball league and all these guys would come to try out for it and they couldn't afford like they couldn't afford like motel rooms so they'd all be literally sleeping three per bed mm. and <laughs> and they're all showering together and i was just like whoa this couldn't be more homoerotic either. Well, yeah, sports is another one. Yeah. It's another major homoerotic, oof, even more than a military, arguably. Right? Yeah. What do, what do the teams do when they win the World Series? They grab each other's Gigantic butts. Gigantic dog pile is what they do, yeah. right? They <laughs> man stack you know, yeah. right there in the middle of the field for everyone to see. Or they or they hit each, you know, they slap each other in the ass. That's all the sports, right? Yeah, and they're showering together all showering the time. Showering together, seeing each other naked all the time. Yeah. I think there is what we associate with like certain right wing more conservative cultural elements which is like football culture baseball culture military culture are all essentially homoerotic it's so interesting and but they don't see it that way of course they're unaware they're 
They're unaware. They're on. They won't say it ever, but I it's think, a way for them to express their homoeroticism, and I'm sure it crosses over so here's all what, the time where okay. they're sleeping together. Here's what's happening, Julian. Yeah. I think I just figured it out. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so these guys don't have an awareness of this stuff. They don't yeah. realize that this thing is queer, that thing is queer, touching your teammates' ass is queer, having a giant man dog pile on the pitching mound after you win the World Series is queer as hell. Yeah. They don't. They don't get it. Yeah. No, seriously, they don't because yeah. they don't have these categories that were invented by people like you and me. Yeah. People like you and me, the learned, the people who went to fancy colleges on yeah. the East Coast, we're the ones who invented this shit. Yeah. And we impose these categories on the way people live. Mm -hmm. So what, and I'm not blaming you at all because I do exactly the same thing. You you come along, you see these Marines who don't know anything about it yeah. doing this thing that you know is is something that has been categorized as queer yeah. by the dominant culture, by the educated classes, as a matter of fact, yeah. right? And then you're imposing, and I'm not saying you shouldn't yeah. do this, but you're basically imposing that idea, that category on this activity, right? You're yeah. sort of basically doing what the, the psychiatrists in the late 19th century did with homosexuality was, you know, man and uh, penis and anus or penis and man's mouth is now homosexual and that means xyz it became yeah. a category with specific components and it may, became an identity you're either, you know gay or not etc right. so in a sense i think you're kind of doing that here it's like to the marines who just weren't clued into this does that make sense yeah but it's you know like everything else it's more complicated but you oh, know it's immensely complicated because when i shot with these baseball players <clears throat> they all at the hotel they were at got in a hot tub and they all were just like wrestling each other and like and in the hot tub in their swimsuits and um god one of them started saying something like he started like pretending to be a girl and like doing all this stuff and at one point one of the baseball players the guy was like fuck i'm trying to remember what they were doing it was something really gay right. and the other guy's like i don't want to kiss you pretending you're a girl in the hot tub and he was like, that's gay. And this one baseball player goes, what are you talking about? Baseball is gay. Uh, the whole thing, everything we do about baseball is gay. And it was amazing. It was like. Was, oh, so you think they do, they are aware of it. Some of them are. Some of them. I'm They're, sure some they, of them are. Yeah. yeah. And um, and I made, that was a show I made for Fox. And um, <laughs> and Fox was like, we're not going to put it in <laughs> on TV that baseball is gay, that the whole thing is gay. But I think what it is is. You know, obviously, you know, there, there's those older pornographers or gay guys who are like, everything was better before the closet mm. was busted open because we could do whatever we want. But it obviously created untold suffering upon millions of people mm. who. Yes. So we're in a transition period now where mm. everyone's trying to wrestle with this stuff. Mm -hmm. But eventually it'll come out the other side where people are going to be like, well, we like to wrestle. I don't mind having sex with another guy or I don't like it, but I still can enjoy wrestling with you guys right. in our swimsuits. <clears throat> so it'd and, be, so it'd be wrestling together with other guys, being in a hot tub with other guys, acting like a girl. Yeah. But we don't need to call that being gay. Yeah. It's just those things. It's yeah. wrestling with a guy. Yeah. It's acting like a girl. Yeah. It's being naked with guys in a hot tub. Yeah. It doesn't need to be called a certain thing. It could just be those activities yeah. in that moment, yeah. right? That's the ultimate queer position to take. Yeah. And you're saying that that's, you're predicting that that is our future as well. I think that's, I, it's so clear that we're transitioning. To I hope point. so. Yeah. I mean, right now we're, however, people sort of on, on the queer side are very busy categorizing things, right? So it's not just, it's not just that they're demolishing the binary. They're trying to replace it. Not everyone, but a lot yeah. of people, right? Replace the binary with 57 other categories or new categories yeah. and they want to put everybody in these new categories right? right i don't think that's the queer position to take the queer position to take is to have no categories or to disregard categories and try right. to move past them categories are like plastic prisons yeah uh wendy brown a great queer theorist i think is that's what she has called them they're like they they move with you but they're always surrounding you and mm -hmm. and and channeling your your energy and your movements yeah controlling to some extent yeah so, I mean, I think we agree, but it, I think, okay, I think I figured it out. Is that? I think it's a, like you have to do the categories before yeah. the full liberation Before you happens. move through them. Yeah, before you move through them. You have to create them. new categories before you move through categories entirely, you think? Yeah, like I, I, like, I don't know, like maybe an easy one is like in the 60s and 70s, suddenly like 
all the Jews could come out of the closet and they yeah. went from, they went from like having to be, you know, having fake names to like, you know, your Lenny Bruce's Woody Allen, who still have fake names, but eventually you get to like where everyone's just like, doesn't care to fa- change their name or hide their Judaism. Right. And then the whole culture moves beyond it. And so you've got to do that with all these different categories, whether they're like asexuals or, you know, or, or blacks. Or by, well, that, right. The, well, that's true. I mean, that, well, yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And um, and so, yeah, with all the racial categories, and um, and so I think each person has to be able to like own who they are, have the pride in it, and then eventually, if they and and the big thing is you have to have like the economic power that I think is you know something we're not talking about is to the point where society respects you because you have economic power and so you could say yeah i'm really into leather and you know this but you know i also run apple you know Mm -hmm. so you're just like well you know donald trump's gonna be like well he does have a billion dollars so you know peter thiel you know like Uh i'm not gonna much as i'm a homophobe but the one thing our society respects is people with lots of fucking money yeah. whether it's peter thiel or oprah or whatever and that's how you move beyond the boundary of like you know homophobia and race is like their heads explode because they you know they can't understand wait how can he be rich if he's below us you know yeah isn't it amazing it's the marine corps i mean it's amazing in so many ways and one of the ways in which it's amazing is that they are the ones who are the first to land on shore they're yeah. the first people to do the thing right yeah. they're the first they lead america into new places and i think incredibly ironically they've in some ways it sounds mm-hmm. like they've led us to this new place sexually yeah that's more liberated yeah wow you know i think it's just like they're people who break boundaries and they some of them don't yeah, care. That's right. And like, and listen, they break if, national boundaries by invading other countries, and they break these boundaries too. It's true. I agree yeah, with you. Yeah, that's right. That's what I'm saying. Like, if it's you're not willing, si- it's not simple. It's not just bad or good, is it? If you go willing to break the first commandment, you know, that's right. Yeah, right. Like yeah. you're like, well, I just killed people. What's the big deal about breaking this minor commandment of sex with other men? You know, the big thing is, you know, how many are out? They're not that out. So that's very different than mm-hmm. like than like a queer movement. See, but being out is is reifying the categories. It's... You're saying, I'm gay, I'm a lesbian, I'm this, I've had, I'm I, that. It's saying, I have no problem with these acts, that mm-hmm. I've done them, and they're not, they don't define me. Right now, you're having to be defined by it, but eventually, it's being like, you know, I mean, God knows how many of these guys, like John McCain, he's in that prison for all those years. Mm. He's had to be masturbating other guys in that prison. Mm. Like, how dispiriting is it when you're, like, in the Hanoi Hilton, you need to be held and you need to be touched. Mm -hmm. And there's no way he wasn't having sex with other men. You think so? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean... I guess. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I I believe it. I'd never thought of that. But, yeah, it makes sense to me. I mean, um, a person just... I mean, you know, I've been developing this documentary on David Allen Coe who spent 20 years in prison and he's just like, here's the thing. Humans need to be touched. Hmm. And if you're in prison or, you know, or in the military, yeah, you need someone to touch you. Or especially if you're going through like horrific experiences, whether it's war, <laughs> basic training or mm-hmm. prison. And who, what are you going to do? It's situational homosexuality, but it's still, you're going to be, needing someone to hold you and hug you and give you affection. And that's once that happens, there's a certain erection. That's probably an erection going to happen. Yeah. And, oh, uh, God. So I want to talk about your career overall right now. Right. And the thing about you that's so amazing to me is that I, you know, professionally for 20 years have constantly been searching under every rock mm-hmm. for weird things yeah. in American society and history and culture. Yeah. And have basically made myself into an expert on American outsiders, rebels, weirdos. But every time I talk to you, you're working on a project about which I know nothing. Like mm-hmm. this gay marine porn thing. When no. you came to me with that, I had never heard of it before. <laughs> you're the, the Wild and Wonderful Whites of West Virginia, which is about this completely insane, renegade, criminal, giant, 
family of hillbillies in West Virginia. Well, they're a multi-generational criminal family who are also tap dancers. Oh, right, right. <laughs> right. Uh, I had ne I never knew about that stuff at all. I never mm -hmm. knew about that culture. And then you have all these other projects you're always working on that you're telling me about that, again, I'm just, it's always new to me. I think it's because you have this background in punk rock, which mm -hmm. is something I, I was only into for a while. And it, there's sort of the whole sub, 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 culture of sort of alternative radical punk rock music that you've mm. kind of always been a part of. And yeah. I think all your projects have some kind of connection to that world in some way or another, like Frank Rodriguez, wasn't he, who got you to the gay Marine porn? Mm. He was sort of in the punk rock scene in some ways. He and... created like one of the first gay punk beer busts, like where he and this drag queen, like Vaginal Davis were. Um... One of the greatest uh, drag names ever, Vag yeah. Vaginal Davis, yeah. Um, and, um, you know, they were booking punk bands, but for a gay audience. And, you know, because when he, you know, when we both got to L.A. first, gay culture was very West Hollywood and like very like boys town kind of, you know, kind of bourgeois, bourgeois gross. Whereas and like if you're a gay punk, there was no yeah. scene for you and you felt like excluded from gay culture. And so he was one of these people who, through fanzines and clubs, created this, you know, an old, a punk rock gay culture that was very rebellious, not about materialism, not about, yeah. you know, uh, you know, getting your facial or whatever. So yeah, and I think your work is all punk. Mm -hmm. I think you're a punk filmmaker. I mean, I think the the aesthetic, the sensibility, the ideas, mm -hmm. the attitude, yeah, is punk rock, and that's why I love it. It's yeah. it's a, it's it's adjacent to and related to my way of thinking. It's different though. Uh -huh. But, and I think that's another reason why I don't know about the stuff that you are interested in, mm -hmm. but it's very close obviously uh -huh. to what I do. But so, so the, so you looked at these hillbilly, this crazy hillbilly family yeah. with your great, I spent a year and a half living, lived with those people yeah. for a year and a half. Um, and then you've been working on other projects about similarly just, I mean, what would you even say? Just complete, rebel crazy people but you have this one project with the leader of a band from the 1960s which was very influential in punk and other music genres and what's this project it's it's a project i'm about to write about rocky erickson who's the lead was the lead singer of this band the 13th floor elevators and uh he's kind of legendary for both predating psychedelic music and punk rock um so Rocky Erickson was um, basically in 65, he he and other guys formed this band, the 13th Floor Elevators in Austin, Texas. Austin still at that time was pretty square. Mm -hmm. It's still, I mean, you know, for, it was Texas and they all discovered LSD and LSD was still legal at that time. And they started preaching to everyone, we've got to start doing more LSD. And um, and they would write their songs on LSD. They would perform on LSD. And they're basically, you know, they're also coming to San Francisco and playing. And like when they came to San Francisco, the Grateful Dead saw them. And the Grateful Dead was still an R&B cover band. And they were like, their minds were blown. They were like, wait, you take LSD and perform on it? They were like, yeah. And like Janis Joplin was their friend in Texas and loved them. And, it's, you know, they say Rocky influenced her song, singing because mm. um, Rocky's this incredible singer and um they're doing all this stuff and the texas police are not happy as you can imagine and they start harassing the fuck out of them and just following them everywhere and pulling them over every time they can and showing up at every show and like tearing their van open and opening their amps to make sure there's no drugs and finally at it and and rocky let's just say is getting a little wacky because he's taking a lot of lsd but, um, but he's, you know, he is there. So, you know, he had one point where he was wearing a, a band aid on his, on his forehead because he was trying to cover up his third eye because his third eye was mm. bothering him. But basically he gets caught with like two or three ounces of marijuana and, um, and he, and it's a felony mm -hmm. <laughs> and he basically decides his lawyers say, you guys serve 10 years in the pri in prison. Let's plead insanity. And they decide, okay, we'll plead insanity. 
and he pleads insanity. And he's this like gentle poet, you know, very much kind of Texas version of a flower child yeah. and, um, and has no idea what he's going to. And they send him to this place called Rusk uh, prison for the uh, criminally insane. Mm. And suddenly he's like, you know, in Arkham Asylum, basically like he's like with like murderers, rapists, rapist murderers, everyone's killed their mom um, and raped her. And, mm. And he's like this guy writing folk songs, like mm. like Dylan esque folk songs with a psychedelic edge, and um, and of course, the I mean this place is known as like a torture factory. It's not like you know we're not trying to heal anybody here. We're trying to torture the fuck out of them. What were they doing to him? They gave him electroshock therapy mm -hmm. and fried his brain out. Yeah, and um, and uh, you know he eventually got out after five years and. Basically, he started. He invented horror rock because um, it was just like write what you're feeling, and all his songs were based on horror movies he'd seen. Because and they're all like influenced by what happened in the Insane Asylum because they're all like I walked with a zombie. They're all like songs about like zombies and monsters trying to kill him, and that became his world. And so he became a zombie. He became a zombie, and you know. Um, Creature with the Atom Brain is one of his songs. It's all like very much like about his own torture seen through horror movies. Yeah. And he just toured. He's on tour right now. So a few weeks ago. And oh, good. He, he sounded great. Like he. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Um, That's the worst. He's, he's someone who like the butthole surfers worship like they would have him open for them. So he's a very influential person in certainly punk rock, but even in sort of pop music generally or rock music yeah yeah i mean like the band television you know tom yeah. Berlin, they used to cover 13th floor elevators yeah. like lots of rem were really <laughs> oh. you hear some rem oh really i'm not that big an rem fan i, but I am i'm a huge rem fan yeah they're i think i forget what they they had a michael stipe sounds a lot like rocky oh, too okay and they had a whole thing where they would say rem stands for rocky erickson music or oh, something really yeah i've been an rem fan since their first year as a touring band yeah yeah i saw them in 1981 uh -huh. in berkeley yeah um zz top because mm -hmm. zz top are from texas oh my god they were obsessed rocky fans back in the day and still are like so it's like everyone was everyone in texas like they were the pinnacle in 1966 of wow yeah so they put him in prison for for possession of marijuana they they gave him electroshock. They shocked. They gave him electrical shocks to his brain. Yeah, probably damaging him forever. It, maybe forever. Certainly for quite a long time. It's um that whole the the state psychiatric industrial con complex of the mid twentieth century. I think is the worst thing that's ever been done to human beings. I think I would rather be hanged, shot by a firing squad, left in a cell than to be in one of those those mental asylums mm -hmm. that people were consigned to by the state it's yeah. it's the where and i live right now about a mile and a half from the one floor of the cuckoo's nest state yeah. hospital in oregon yeah and every time i drive by it i think about it and i know about it and it's just the horror is infinite mm. for me yeah. the, the thought of that those mm. places and what went on in there um, so you, so yeah, you've been, you've always been attracted to these supreme outsiders. People who are even outside of the worlds that I've been attracted to. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I, I've been trying to like figure your career out, like, or be able to sort of find themes in it. So there's a yeah. punk rock theme yeah. that I discovered here, which makes a lot of sense to me. A music theme. I was last year a producer on the show, Mike Judge presents Tales from the Tour Bus on Cinemax, where I did they're um, animated documentaries. So I did them on Johnny Paycheck and George Jones and Tammy Wynette. So right. I was a producer and writer on that. And that goes back to, you know, both of those guys yeah. were crazy as fuck. That's, yeah, you use the word crazy. And I've used that word a couple times in this interview. And I'm ashamed of it every time I use it. But it's hard to get rid of it. Um, oh, yeah. I've been seeing people be like, you can't use the word crazy. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm with them. I don't want to be a pain in the ass and pedantic about yeah. it. But I do think... It's a very, it's not, 
it's not a good word. <laughs> and it's done a lot of damage to a lot of people in a lot of ways. But you've been you've been attracted to in all of your projects. I feel like if you use it en enough, it loses. I don't know. Yeah. Well, you've just been. Well, I was yeah. going to say you've been attracted to people in your projects, in your work, in your career who have been categorized as crazy. Yeah. And insane. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. And yeah, like Jessica White from the White family's bipolar, and uh, I don't know what else. He has like three different definitions. So. Right, and those are the people you you are grav you gravitate toward. Uh, unfortunately, right. And you, you have a history with the Jackass guys. Johnny Knoxville yeah. was yeah. the co-producer of the producer. Whites, producer of the Whites, yeah. but he was a very executive much, producer. He was a partner too, right? I mean, it was oh, very much. Yeah, and so you're tight with. I mean, there's he's the best. Yeah, yeah. So he and he's crazy in these ways, right? He's pretty. Yeah, Definitely. I mean, he's also at the he, time, and the, when they were doing their thing, they were the yeah, craziest. They're nuts. Yeah, they yeah. No, it's it's another weird dichotomy because he's also like the smartest person you, you, one of the smartest people you'll ever meet. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Like we we'd get on an airplane when we were going to the film premiere of Wild Whites, and he bought like six magazines. Like he bought Atlantic, New Yorker, you know, every every Harper's. He like it's a six hour flight. Hmm. I was like. And I said to his wife, you know, maybe, I don't know, like maybe two more. I was like, uh, uh, what, what's another one with big article? I don't know. It was like, I was like, how, I was like, what, why is he buying so many? You can't read that many. He goes, she goes, oh, like, oh yeah, he'll buzz through all of them and be done before the plane. You know, oh, the New Yorker. That's what it was. It was the New Yorker. Johnny, Johnny Knoxville reads the New Yorker. Yeah. Who knew? And I was like, you know, the New Yorker takes me like three days to read. Oh, yeah. And he's just like, he's going to read every article in the New Yorker and Atlantic and Harper's on a six hour plane ride and and retain it. He's got like this insane photographic memory where we'd be editing Wild Whites and he would come in and he'd have seen like a scene once, like he'd seen the rough footage once and he'd just sit down and start doing the dialogue along with with the you know, the stuff on the, you know the monitor yeah. and i'd be like i've watched this footage like 50 times at this time because you know because i've been cutting it i don't remember every line and he remembered every line you know so these people also all live in alternate universes uh -huh. of their own making he's made his own universe in an amazing way yeah yeah but all the people you're interested in yeah so you, you told me something before we started yeah recording that tied a lot of this together i think in my head yeah. it's a theory i have uh -huh. you can shoot it down tell me i'm an asshole yeah if i'm if you don't agree with me but you told me about your brother yeah and you know i know this is hard to talk about but you told me that he was he's a schizophrenic he's schizophrenic and my grandmother had definitely schiz a lot of schizophrenia in uh, her too okay she was a holocaust denier uh, Holoc i was gonna say holocaust <laughs> denier well as a schizophrenic she might have been no no she was a holocaust survivor yeah and you know you know, who knows how much it went back, how much is it result? Because they have all these things now about like RNA changing yeah. in response to situations. So um, hmm. so where'd you grow up? I grew up in the Bronx. Which, which part? In Riverdale, which there's fancy parts of Riverdale. We didn't grow up in the fancy part. Oh. We grew up looking at the Henry Hudson Parkway. Yeah. And one of these apartments where it's like rear window where like you look out your window and you see everyone else oh, in yeah. their underwear. I lived in a lot of those apartments in New York. Yep. Like where you don't get sunlight, you, uh, you know, and you sit on, you know, there's a fire escape to sit on. I lived in those apartments for years and years and years, but never as a child. And I never certainly grew up in one. Yeah. You did though. Yeah. That's interesting too. I didn't know that either. In retrospect, you. it's so depressing. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh God. I hated those. I hated anything. them. Yeah. They're, it's almost like living in a jail. Yeah. Right. You're yeah. Just staring at the other prisoners. Wall. Yeah. Yeah. Or a brick. I lived in an air shaft for two years. Yeah. You know, the bottom of an air shaft in New York in an apartment building. That's the worst ever. But and you can't open your windows without worrying about people looking in on you, which if someone's paranoid is bad. <laughs> what did your parents do? My dad was a high school English teacher. Uh huh. And um, my mom didn't work for a bunch of years and then ended up working. My mom was Austrian, so she was bilingual and she ended up working for a German bank. Hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. so as like a bilingual translating mm -hmm. person. And you did you live in that apartment for most or all of your childhood? Uh, we lived in a different apartment. Then we moved to England for one year. Then we moved to Vienna, lived with my grandmother for oh. two years. Oh. And then lived in that apartment till like 11th or 12th grade when my dad, my parents got divorced around when I was 14 or 15. Okay. 
And then my dad threw me out and I ended up senior year living with my mom in Manhattan in this tiny apartment that was miserable. Like my mom and her boyfriend lived in the living room. Like their bed was in the living room. Oh boy. Yeah. And I had a little bedroom. Then my brother moved in and like, it was like both of us in this tiny room with a trundle bed. Yeah. Um, and, and you're a teenager. Yeah. It was torture. God. Yeah. yeah I, like there was no privacy. Oh boy. So a lot of close quarters growing up. Yeah. It's fucking it was and awful. Is your brother your only sibling? Thank God, yeah. Okay. <laughs> because I would imagine it was or hard. Or maybe there could be a good sibling. Well, why did you say that? Because it was hard to Yeah. To be with him. My whole family is pretty insane. It was like fighting, screaming, things getting thrown out of windows. Um Hmm. Uh, like coming in and breaking my records because they didn't like my dead Kennedy's records. Like, um, huh. uh, yeah, lots of yeah ugliness. Like, I didn't know that wasn't normal. Yeah. And Frank Rodriguez, who we mentioned, um, I remember freshman year in college, he came over. I like, I was like, come over for dinner with my family, and within like ten minutes, my brother was like fuck you mom i hate you i hope you die and she's like i wish i'd had an abortion and you were never born and they're just like screaming at each other and i know awareness i was not normal i was just like well yeah 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 like that so what what else you know we were talking and he said he'd never been like around that like if like someone in any of his family had said like fuck you mom i hope you die like that person would have been punished forever, but and that was normal in your household. This is a... totally normal, totally S- normal. Screaming at each other, cursing at each other, insulting each other, saying horrible. Like I remember at the age of thirteen, one day going like, "I haven't not cried a single day this year." Really? Like there hasn't been a single day. Oh man. Where like, yeah, like my mom. Oh, man. I would go like. I'm so sorry. This is how crazy it was. My. Like, I was just desperate. To, I hated my high school, and I hated my family, and I just wanted to get out of there. And so around 15, I decided I was going to take summer school every year so I could graduate a year early and get out. And my mom had some fight with my dad, and she ended up, like, scratching me across the face. And so I, like, had these big scratches. And this is before, like, people took child abuse seriously. So no one yeah. – like, I'm in school with, like, these big – mom red nail scratches on my face and no one's like we should call child protective services and then my mom to punish me told me i couldn't go to summer school <laughs> like normally your parents are like you'll go to summer school right and she's like you're not going to summer school so because that was your escape summer school was your escape it was just something i wanted to do and yeah. she decided to punish me by not letting me go holy crap man i didn't yeah. know that about you okay and so your mom is abusive and crazy in those ways and then your brother yeah. is clinically crazy because yeah. when did they diagnose him uh 21 so it was like one of those things where you know there's something weird going on mm-hmm. but we can never figure it out like every time you go to the bathroom he comes in right after you to check how everything is arranged on all the shelves and if the soap is in the right place. So like also OCD symptoms. Hmm. He's actually not got schizophrenia. He's got schizoaffective disorder. Do you know what that nope. is? It's like schizophrenia and bipolar. <laughs> so it's like, woo-hoo. Whoa. we're going for Jesus. both. And you're sharing a room with him much of the time. Yeah. So what was the, when was the first time you noticed that your brother was different than you? Or how? Oh, when he was a little kid. Okay. And how? How was he different? My dad, you know, is in it, what is like a guy with a giant library. Like his whole life is reading. Mm. And I was a big reader and my mom was a reader and my brother just never liked to read. Hmm. And it was really weird in our family for someone not to like to read. And and then he just, you know, he was really bad at school, um, never wanted to do his homework. Um didn't want to had a lack of what's it called interest in doing that. I don't know, I'm spacing on the word, but um, like lack of ambition okay. uh, to do stuff like, but it's even weirder. Like my mom would be cooking and she'd be like, Hey, I just realized there's no garlic. Could you 
just run to the store and get garlic. And the store is one block away. And he'd be like, no, I'll go with you, but I won't go. And, uh, and it was just like, why wouldn't you go? Like, why wouldn't you just like, it takes five minutes. And he just had an inability to do things, which is really, you know, one of the things of schizophrenia is unableness to inability, I guess is the correct word, um, to change and like do things. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm spacing on the, I, the I don't know. I don't know any of this stuff. So yeah, I can't yeah. help you. <laughs> inability to do what? What's to want to change your circumstances it's like a lack of self will maybe i don't know okay like like there's like a stasis or in stasis. Inertia? inertia inertia like okay. you cannot if I, if I was i'm trying to think of the word there but there's a word for it but mm -hmm. basically there's there's what's called positive and negative symptoms of schizophrenia um, and the positive aren't positive. The positive are like hallucinations yeah, right. and paranoia. The negative are like uh, lack of ambition, lack of... I didn't, yeah, I didn't know about that. Yeah, lack of... So my brother will like spend every day being like, my life is terrible. I have no friends. And I'll be like, well, there's a support group meeting you can go to. You could meet people. He'll say, I, I have no support. Go mm -hmm. to the support group meeting. No, I can't go to the support group meeting. Why can't you go to the support group meeting? You know? And then you'll, and it'll go on for years and years, like the same discussions and the same inability to change your situation. Mm. So it's super frustrating. I bet. So. I bet. I bet. And being stuck in close quarters with them in the same room with them for years and years and years. Yeah. No escape. And your mom's throwing stuff at you and Jesus. Yeah. People are like, how did you get along with the whites? You're from New York and. You know, <laughs> yeah, really. Your your family in some ways worse and crazier than the whites. I didn't know this. Yeah, like people are like, how did you Which do is that? Saying they something. seem crazy. If anybody's I'm... seen your movie, that's saying something, man. Yeah. That's wow. Yeah. I so I'm know. like used to people screaming in at each other. So I just like uh... Well, that's what's interesting to me. Yeah. Right. And so you a lot of people in your circumstances with families like yours or the family like yours would just move away from it and they would just go to suburbia and have like a Labrador retriever and a, you know, nice wife and nice kids yeah. and all that. But you've just gone right back toward <laughs> your brother and your mom yeah. and all that craziness constantly over. Is that right? Like just, you just I'm keep sure some, finding I'm people. Sure some psychiatrist would say there's like, you know, that's a way to deal with it and process it. I, I don't know if you're like trying to reconnect or something with them, or but it seems pretty clear that you are drawn to people who are like them. You, you seek out people who are like them. I think, you know, do you know much about PTSD? A little bit. You know, like how people with PTSD when there is no craziness that they start panicking mm. and that when they like, and then when there's craziness, you go into a state of calm. Like it's what soldiers yeah. from PTSD. Like I have that. You do. Yeah. I think cause I had some, I had a chaotic childhood too, not as bad as yours, but it's certainly chaotic and um, quiet and sameness. Yeah. Make me panic sometimes, mm. right? If I feel like nothing's changing around me, or I'm not changing, I'm no. not moving, or things aren't happening yeah. around me, I panic. That's why, like driving through a suburb or a small town in the middle of nowhere, like yeah. I actually feel this despair and, and terror. <laughs> I do, and yeah. I and I used to just write it off as like snobbery, you know, because yeah. I was from the fancy cities and these are just hicks. Blah, blah. Yeah. No, I think it's actually that. I think yeah. it's that I'm. I was always used to things going on. People were in my in my family where there was lots of talking and some yelling and fights and yeah. stuff like that too. And, and that's, that's my world yeah. was my world. And I think I just, yeah, I can't, there's a terror because it's different yeah. when it's quiet. Yeah. Is that? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm different now. I've done a lot of therapy. Like ideally I like a quiet life. <laughs> like yeah. I also can be just totally happy in the desert, like reading books and, yeah. um, and, but, you know, but, when I'm shooting, like when I was shooting with the whites and Mamie would start screaming, I would just go to a quiet place. I'd be like, okay, here we go. And I would just be very relaxed. I mean, knots would form up and down my back. I mean, while I was making that movie, I went at one point to get a massage and um, at this like chiropractic office in West Virginia. And the lady said, I've never seen knots like this and the person not being in debilitating pain. Mm. 
like unable to function. And I was like, yep, yep. And then like she got all the knots out after like a two hour massage. And I got in the car with Mamie White and Sue Bob White. And they just started screaming at each other. And I just felt like pop, 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 pop. Each knot was like, I'm back, pop, you know, bitch, you know. <laughs> <laughs> huh. Have you, has any shrink ever theorized about this? Well, I guess you sort of said this, but I, well, no, I, I guess you didn't. Has any, have any of your shrinks ever theorized about this and thought that you were trying to reconnect with your brother and mother or trying to, I don't know, like, or there's some odd attraction to them? I mean, what? I don't, I don't know if we've gone that into it. I kind of, I think I stopped doing therapy. Maybe it was right after Wild White's. I can't remember what it was. So well, let me ask you this. Yeah. What's your relationship been like with your brother and mother since you left? Well, my mom died 15 years ago. Oh, okay. Um, and then my brother moved in with my stepdad, stayed with my stepdad. And, um, and even when he was living with my mom, it was crazy. It was just like crazyville. I mean, the story that I think, like explains my mom most is one time I went to that uh, to visit them and they'd moved to Florida at that time. Um, and every day they'd have the same arguments screaming at each other. And I just was like, you know, mom, don't, don't you get bored of this? This is just so tiresome every day. You have like a half hour screaming argument. And, um, and my mom was retired at that point already. And, and she said, you know, I'm retired. I play tennis. I visit with my friends. It's kind of a boring life. Usually the arguing part of the day is the most exciting part yeah, of the day. That's it. And, and I was like, whoa, that's fucked up. And my mom was also like super hmm. controlling. And her whole thing was family minded was her mantra. And, um, and everything has to be family minded. And I was someone who betrayed the family. Um, I finally. How I'm, did you betray it? Uh, oh, I'll get, yeah. So finally, when she had cancer, I finally got her to go to therapy for like a few sessions, and I went to one session with her in the hospital, and the, and she started explaining. Julian has always betrayed the family. He's always valued his friends more than his family. As soon as he graduated college, you know what he did? He moved out from our house and moved to Kentucky and got a job. <laughs> and the therapist was like, well, doesn't that mean that you were a successful parent <laughs> because you created someone who could move away from your family exactly, and get a job and function? And she was like, huh, I never thought of that. And like into my 30s, she and my stepdad would be like, you know, if you get sick of L.A. and want to move back in with us, you can. And I'm like, ah. <laughs> like, I'll think about it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like that was, I think her ideal. So in the way she created my brother in some ways, cause her ideal is someone who had no friends Yo. and just lived at home. Jesus. Right. And could give her the, the arguing kick every oh, day. Jesus. So he was her drug. He was her drug. Yeah. Oh boy. He gave her meaning cause her whole meaning was being a mom and when for those like two years he didn't live with her, her life was really empty. And um, hmm. so. So where's your brother now? He lives in Florida still. And, um, and, and just to give you a sense of the craziness, I mean, a few years ago, like the, he was living in Palm Beach with my stepdad and it just was getting, it was just insane. It was like, just, you know, he'd call me with death threats all the time and threatening to kill you, threatening to kill me, cursing. And, um, he'd be watching news all day. That's all he did all day was yeah. he had no social life and he'd watch CNN and Fox and just stand in front of the TV yelling, fuck you at different political leaders as mm. I think anyone would, if they watch more than half an hour of TV, but he was watching eight hours in his schizo <laughs> schizoaffective disorder. Um, but then he started going outside and he was yelling Heil Hitler all the time mm. on the street outside, you know, in a neighborhood that might have a few people of the Jewish persuasion and it, and, um, including him, including him. And, um, and the police would get called on him all the time. And 
And so he's watching TV. He'll see signals from the TV. Like if a reporter's standing in front of like a, a street sign, that street sign was picked to give him a message. You know, he's like, why did it say, you know, uh, you know, Yellow Street, you know, where they try to say I'm a coward. And he'd be like, you know, the president's scared of me because I could lead a revolution. He had things like that, too. And so then he was like yelling Heil Hitler on the street all the time because he want and the police would come and they'd be like, I'm not. And he'd say, I'm not anti-Semitic, but the government's run by fascists and they're watching me. And I want them to know that I know they're fascists. So that's why I'm yelling Heil Hitler on the street, mm -hmm. which did not make his neighbors no. very happy. So it had an internal logic, though. Yes. Right. Because everything's internal with him. Yeah. Everything's internal with schizophrenics, right? It's there. They become very self-centered yeah. and they create internal worlds. Yeah. They can't have a, con they can't have a conversation. It's hard to have a conversation and care about you because their brain is fritzing so fast and hard that like, it's all like, what does this mean? What does that mean? Who's spying on me? Are the police there to look at me? It's like talks are like that are very fast. What do you mean? The police. I saw the police today. Why Why the police? Why were the police? Why did the police drive by the supermarket walls there? Do you think they were watching me? Are they trying to arrest me? Do they know something about something? You know? Yeah. Um, Man. I, I, I'm I, just, it's, I, I'm so sorry. Yeah. And so, you know, I don't know what the, you know, I know you're friends with all these libertarians and, <laughs> and I'm like, mm. at this oh, point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What do we do with them? Very socialist because you go to Europe you know, I was just there. I saw two homeless people the whole time. There was like, they take care of the mentally ill. They like, you know, they give them mental health. They give them housing. And um, and I don't know what the libertarian answer to this shit is, but I think you need a giant, super generous statewide or nationwide response to this based on empathy, based on paying mental health people a decent salary because they get paid shit. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, like there's such turnover like among people who like work with him because it's, you know, a high stress job, you know, it's a super high stress mm -hmm. job and they get paid shitty and they all have to have master's degrees <laughs> and, um, you know, and, um, and they haven't figured out like a good housing situation for people like him. And it's one of these things where there aren't enough services, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So we're sitting about three or four blocks from, I think it's the largest homeless encampment in the United States of America, yeah. which is called Skid Row in Los yeah. Angeles. It's actually about one quarter of the entire downtown of Los Angeles. Yeah. People don't know this. I didn't know this. I had lived in Los Angeles for years before I moved to the downtown. And that's yeah. when I found out how yeah. big it was. It is probably what, like half a mile by half a mile or maybe maybe even a mile square yeah. of ju of it's like calcutta you're in the yeah. third world it's schizophrenic people yeah drug addicted people drug on the streets drug addicted schizophrenic people or both sleeping yeah. on the streets in masses there are people in the streets walking th down the street you can't drive through there there's no businesses that operate in that area yeah. of the downtown it's completely sh shut down it's controlled dominated by these just armies of homeless yeah schizophrenic and drug addicted people and uh, it's 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 walking the walking dead yeah and it's sh just shocking in so many ways but one of the ways in which it's shocking is like i think and i don't know what the politics are like what the city government clearly is aware of this and what have, what have they said about that i'm sure they've had debates and i'm sure there's, this has been an issue i've never seen anything about it but yeah, like and fucking garcetti wants to run for president and he hasn't done anything i just want to know what the hell yeah. he's thinking like what i mean this is the downtown of los angeles yeah. you know i mean you can't have a business you can't have a hotel you can't do anything there you can't have a restaurant um and i, I listen i grew up yeah. in new york and i remember reagan got elected and before reagan there were like bowery bums Right, who Bower, like, Bowery Street bums, yeah, yeah, right. they were like bums, mm -hmm. mostly white guys. They were real bums. They weren't. They weren't people with serious mental illness or serious. They were alcoholics. Yeah, yeah. but they weren't like fully debilitated like these people who are no, on the street they right here. Like this. Yeah, right. And, um, and but, you know, it wasn't frightening. It wasn't heartbreaking. Yeah. You know, I mean, I was young, so my heart was a little harder then, um, or I had less. You know 
developed empathy or understanding of things. But you know, but but then Reagan came to power, and whatever you want to say about the mental hospitals of those times, at least they were inside. You know. It's hard because, as I said, I think it's yeah. the worst thing that's ever been done, and I'm I stand I by think that. This is worse, though. I don't know, I don't know, I really don't know, and yeah. it's a hard one. I I think that they need to be, there needs to be some entity, some large entity, yeah. that has to do this, right? There has to be some place for them to go that's large enough to accommodate all of them, that takes care of them, makes them safe, makes them secure, yeah, but removes them, yeah. Unfor- I mean, they have to be removed from you know, society essentially, Mm -hmm. but taken care of. And so whether that's the government or whether that's a private entity or whether it's a church, I don't know which one is best. My pref, I have preferences there, Mm. but it's a, it's in a huge problem. Uh, I do not want to send them back to state mental hospitals. Mm -hmm. Certainly not the ones that existed. Maybe the Norwegian state mental hospitals, you know, those are the places to be. Yeah. But anyway, I just, um, with nice Ikea furniture. It was nice. Yeah, they got, they're amazing, actually. Norwegian prisons. Have yeah. you seen these? Yeah. No. The, um, well, anyway, so I, uh, it's a remarkable story. I didn't know this about you. Yeah. And it does perhaps maybe makes, help make sense of your career, which is so phenomenal. But f- I was having a hard time sort of finding themes in it, but I think I found at least a couple possible themes here. Well, I think, you know, having this therapy session with you um yeah. <laughs> you know that's what we do here <laughs> um the one thing you really question when you're dealing with a, you know a schizophrenic person is the whole idea of the human brain and whether we're actually have any self-will or control mm. or you know you know whether you can judge anyone because mm-hmm. obviously his brain is just like a computer brain that's gone. The wires are crossed. It's fritzing out and you can spend every day as I have for like, like I spent three years every day talking to him for an hour and nothing changed. And, um, you know, thinking just like, if I really spend time like trying to get to the bottom of things, I can help him. And I couldn't. And I just like ended up in major depression where like, it was like, days not being able to write or or do work because it's like you know in america everything every movie teaches you you can solve something like you know if you just like love someone hard enough you gotta figure it out and you know and i can't figure it out for the life of me like what i can do to help his life and um so you know you start going like okay you know i did an interview with ted kaczynski you, wait, hold on. You didn't. You, you did an interview with Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, right? Yeah, <laughs> twenty years ago or so, right? Uh, no, right after around nine eleven. Okay, so yeah, whatever you. I don't and know. you did it by mail, right? Postal mail. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Yeah. But like, can I judge Ted Kaczynski? Can I judge, you know, all the, you know, even like the horrible people, like mm-hmm. you know, like like I have a friend who became, um, a Holocaust denier, and I've tried to like figure that out like how did one of my good friends become like this proud boy holocaust denier guy and i'm like well his brain fritzed out it's not like there isn't logic to humans they're all you know um you know it's all accidental it's all it's almost like um predetermination of what's it called like calvinism or something oh yeah i'm a yeah. total i'm an agnostic on why people hold particular beliefs yeah or why they are a, a particular way we just don't have an explanation for it like why did you yeah i mean why do you have your particular sensibilities we just don't know but yeah so, so what i'm saying is like i'm less judgmental of the most fucked up people because yep i can see oh that's it it's not that's it that's it that's why you can do your art that's why you can do your art about them yeah because you can't you can't do good art about those people if you're judging them from the get-go yeah and because of your experience with your brother and probably your mother too right you've been able to suspend judgment because you that was normal yeah being with those people was normal so you're it's easier for you than most people yeah that's it that's why you're such a that's why you're so good at what you do that's right yeah I mean, though, at this point, That's I'm it. just like, I want to only be surrounded by like serene, I'm not sure. crazy people. I'm sure. Whereas when I was younger, I was just like, all right. But then why do you keep picking these projects that put you in close proximity to the craziest people in the world? Well, here's the thing about <laughs> telling stories. 
the normal people aren't that interesting, mm. right? Yeah, I found, yes. Right, like the, the guy, you know, like in Wild and Wonderful Whites, at one point, there's this lawyer who we're interviewing, and I included this in the film because, you know, he was just like, he's like, why are you following the Whites? There were so many other people in West Virginia, right? <laughs> yeah. He's like, there's- Like, like one, the governor, you could have talked to him. Right, he said, there's this <laughs> one kid in town who got all straight A's and he just got a scholarship to MIT. Why didn't you talk to him, Julian? Why didn't you do a documentary on him? And I'm like, because he sits around studying all day boring. and it's boring. Like, what am I going to learn? What insights am I going to get into the human condition watching a guy? Or, who... or your audience. What is your audience going to learn, right? Yeah, or yeah. what's interesting about it. It's like dysfunctional, you know, like whatever the checkoff thing is like, you know, all the crazy families are the interesting ones, like crazy is allows you to process your life um you know seeing like you know m you know mitt romney's family probably is really dreadfully dull as they like get together so i'm sure they've got their problems so because you were so forthcoming and because you've talked about some difficult stuff and dark stuff next time you're on yeah we're going to talk only mm -hmm. about your musicals okay because people don't even know this you, yeah. you've also produced a musical and you're about to produce a, a new one about yeah. michael jackson and yeah. And Donny Osmond, yeah. <laughs> it's really... It's, it's an amadeus Salieri relationship between Michael Jackson and Donny Osmond. Which, yeah, which no one knows about anymore. It's really typical Julian Nitzberg. It's totally politically incorrect in the best ways. And it is something, I promise you, because I've already heard some of the, the music, some of the songs, it is something you've never heard or seen before in your life. Mm -hmm. It's um, as it's true for everything you do. Oh, every, thank every, you. Oh, oh, no doubt about that. Yeah. I mean... Every project that I've ever seen of yours or heard of yours, it's just, it is truly unique. Mm -hmm. And now I think I understand why. I think I figured it out better with you. Thank you. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, man. That's great. I can't wait to have you on again to talk about uh, more. Did you take my health insurance more fun? for therapy? <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll talk about payment later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Off the air. Thank you so much for doing this. Oh, thanks for having me. I really, this was great. Thanks, man. This was the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. To support the show and become a member of the Unregistered community, go to unregisteredunderground.com. To get information and to buy tickets to the Renegade University weekend events in Los Angeles and Washington, D.C., go to thaddeusrussell.com slash courses. Thanks for listening.